Yes, today, this is the second Arrowhead Innovation Network workshop that we've done this semester. And today we are featuring Andrew Sellers, our Avengers Corporation out of Albuquerque, and he will be giving a talk on the patent application process. So, go All right. ahead. Thank you, Christian. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, just a brief kind of commercial about and tell you where I'm from. I work in Albuquerque for a company by the name of Technology Ventures Corporation. And we're part of the uh, Lockheed Martin contract that manages Sandia. So what we undertake are activities that help commercialize technologies out of the laboratories. And the good news under that contract is we're able to work with folks throughout uh, the state of New Mexico. So we'll work with folks spinning technologies out of the universities or just in the public domain, the private sector. Um, we mainly work with high-tech companies. And the way we do that is uh, providing assistance, mentoring, going from developing your technology into a business case and then into an investment case. Um, we have tools like commercial databases for market research. Um, I'm a patent agent, we'll talk a lot about that. So intellectual property assistance, and then of course access to investors, so ultimately being connected to investors. The really good news is the Arrowhead Center here provides a lot of that assistance, and they have some really good people here. In fact, I'll talk about it. You've got really one great resource here that I wish I had in Albuquerque, and I don't. And I'll talk about that later. So anyway, the first sheet on your package is really just kind of a, I would call a, a business plan template, if you will. I'm not going to go through it. You can just take that and go through it at your own time. That, if you are considering undertaking a business and, and approaching investors, these, this is the kind of information an investor would want to know before they put money into your venture. In addition, even if you're not pursuing investors, even if this is going to be your own money that you're putting into this, you're an investor investing your time and your money. So it's, it's worth the, you know, the research it would take to go through this because in the end, it's better to fail fast and save a lot of money before you go through developing products and distribution channels and building a business if it turns out that the business model is flawed or there's something wrong with it. So I would encourage you taking the approach of going through this kind of a document. Now normally I take three hours to go through this, so what I've done is I'm going to pare this down to um, just uh, the patent itself. We we'll talk about what a patent is, what kind of protection it gives you, how to prepare an application, and how to respond to the office, uh, the patent office, to what are called office actions and ultimately obtain an issued patent. Okay? Um, first off, let me give you a disclaimer if you forget that. So my disclaimer is I'm not a I'm not an attorney. Okay? If you have a technical degree, you can sit before the patent office bar, take the bar, and if you pass it, um, you become a patent agent, a registered patent agent. If in addition to that you have a law degree, then you go on to the rules as a, as a registered patent attorney. The only difference being is I can't practice in a court of law, but I can practice before the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So ultimately, anything before it goes into a lawsuit or something in a courtroom, um, a patent agent is competent to, to represent you. So um, there's those two kinds of professionals that are out there. But what I'm going to teach you is it's possible to go through this process and obtain a patent without representation. You do it on your own. It's not the easiest thing to do. You may walk away from this class thinking, you know, I grasped 15% of it, 20%, whatever the number is. A lot of people, my clients up in the northern part of the state, they take this class two or three times. They show up with a draft. I'll help them give a critique their draft. They go back and reiterate, but eventually do come up with an application. The other thing you might consider is after taking this class, you may come up with a draft and ultimately say, well, you know, I can't quite, quite get it ready to present to the patent office. But I've already got something that an attorney could review, and therefore it might take a lot less attorney time, okay, or patent agent time. And then finally, even if you don't pursue either of those options, um, or if you do pursue the attorney options, um, it'll teach you a lot more about the process. So instead of just writing retainer checks to a professional, you at least know how the process goes, how it's proceeding, what steps they're at, okay? And that ultimately benefits both you and the practitioner. Okay, so let's get straight to um, what is a patent. So the patent has its roots in the Constitution. In the Constitution, there's a paragraph that says Congress shall have the power to promote the progress in science, progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And what that set up was when they were forming the country was a quid pro quo that says, okay, 
in exchange for you disclosing to the public what you've invented, we're going to give you a 20-year monopoly, so to speak, on that technology. Okay, so that's the quid pro quo. Um, and what that monopoly really is, is it gives you, doesn't give you the right to practice anything. It does give you the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling. Okay, that's what a patent is. So before you can practice your art, you may have to go do a further search and find out who else might be excluding you with their patents, but that's the only right you get from a patent. Okay. So in law, statutes in the United States are something called the U.S. Codes. You have the Constitution, you have U.S. Code, and the code that pertains to patents is the 35, Title, title 35. And the main paragraph is 101, which just says, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, composition matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent. So those are the four statutory types of patents. Process, machine, manufacture, or composition matter. Okay? Now, further uh, expanding on the, the U.S. title or the U.S. code are the Code of Federal Regulations. That just gets a little bit deeper into the detail of the rules and regulations for, uh, for how an application needs to be produced, processed, and ultimately issued as a patent. And then, of course, because it is law, there's case law. And so a lot of times uh, there are various cases that are very important to things like patentability um, or obviousness or other issues that come up, and we'll get into that. And then finally, there's what's called the Manual of Patent Examining Procedure. And if you were to print that out front to back, it'd probably be a stack of paper like this. And that's the manual. Those are the actual instructions that the Patent Office uses to examine a patent. Okay? So I'm not going to refer, for the most part, to any of this. I'm not going to, I'm going to try my best to not refer to legalities. It's going to be translated in kind of the layman's terms of what the requirements are for a patent application. Okay. So there was the four statutory types that I talked about, and in those, here's the three major categories, a utility patent, a design patent, or plant patents, okay? So I'm going to talk mainly about utilities, but there are, I also brought an example of a design patent. A utility patent is something that has function, has utility, okay? Um, that's the process machine manufacturer composition of matter. You have 20 years protection from the priority date which usually is the application date, okay? And I'll explain on that, about that a little bit later. A design patent only protects the ornamental design of something. So those are used for things such as maybe tire tread designs, sometimes the jewelry industry uses those, but I've got an example I'll show you. It's even used for a uh, multimeter, okay? You'll see an example there. Plant patents, very obviously, they're geared towards um, new plants that are invented, and perhaps here at New Mexico State, I'm sure that there's a portfolio of plant patents. Those are 20 years from the priority date as well. Design patents are only 15, but they're from the issue date. All right. There's other types of intellectual property that I'm not going to cover, and in fact, these you need an attorney for, copyright, trademark, or trade secret. Okay. First off, the costs for applying for a patent. There's what are called kind of, I'll well, say the MSRP or the full boat rate uh, for patents. Then there's a second category. If you qualify as a small entity, you get a 50% discount off the full rate. If further than that, you also qualify for micro entity, you get another 50% off. Okay? So if you qualify for micro entity status, you're, you're basically getting 25% of the price to apply for a patent. So small entity status is reserved for those companies that are 500 employees or less. So virtually everybody in New Mexico, every company in New Mexico can this work. Um, and in addition, though, you're not under an obligation to assign the patent to somebody who is in that category. So for example, I'm a Lockheed Martin employee. If I came up with an invention and I'm obligated to assign that to Lockheed, clearly they wouldn't meet that test. But if I wanted to apply for it on my own and I was still obligated to assign it to them, I'd have to pay the full rate. I would not qualify for small entity. Micro entity is in addition to qualifying for small uh, entity status um, if you meet uh, the, ha the income requirements. So your income as an individual can exceed three times the median household income. And I looked that up, it's about 160,000. Doesn't include your spouse, okay? Um, so it's just you and your income. But furthermore, you can have had more than four applications, your own patent applications in the past. 
Okay, doesn't it count applications for your employer, but applications that you've turned in. So most everybody that I give classes to qualify for my perennial status. So it's very attractive pricing. Okay, so here's the pricing. So let's start with the non-provisional, which is a regular utility patent, okay? The full price is $1,600. So for my perennity, you get a quarter of that. So $400, you can have an application on file in the U.S. Patent Office, be able to claim patent pending for $400, okay? Um, design patents are cheaper, $190, and plant patents are $285. Now, there is this thing called the provisional filing that a lot of people have heard about. And they think, oh, provisional filing is really simple. I can throw it together, 65 bucks and patent pending. On the surface, that's true, but you've got to be very careful about a provisional patent. What a provisional patent is, is it's a, it's a patent application that never gets examined. Okay, it goes into the patent office, goes on file, and they never examine it. In fact, it expires in 12 months. So what good is that? Those typically are used for folks that are maybe researchers and they're going to present at a conference, but somebody's identified the fact that there could be some patentable matter there. So quick, get a provisional on file, they take their deck of slides or whatever they've got, slap a cover sheet on, pay the, pay the money and get it to the patent office. The trick is, is you've got to file the non-provisional referencing that provisional within 12 months if you want to secure that priority date. Okay? All right, so that if you want your invention date, or what's called the priority date, of the filing of the provisional, then you, then you claim that in the non-provisional filing within 12 months, okay? Otherwise, you lose that, that ability, okay? Also, you may take a strategy to just let the provisional um, expire, and those expire in secrecy. So that's all I'll really talk about provisionals. For the most part, we're talking about non-provisionals. Okay, let's look at just a quick overview of a pattern. So the second sheet back is, is the, kind of the fat package. And it, it's, um, yeah, if you don't have a handout, anybody not have handouts? Okay. So what we're going to look at is in the upper right-hand corner, or in the upper corners, I've written in a page number. So because there's several documents in here, each with their own page number, I'm going to refer to my page numbers up in the corner. Okay? So patent application, in this particular case, starts on page um, page 13. So if you just kind of quickly flip page from page 13 to page uh, 36, 35 actually, 13 to 35, that's a complete application minus the PTO page. And it's going to follow this outline. Okay? Some of these sections are non-applicable, um, but, the, but the ones you have to have are the title of the invention, background of the invention, brief summary of the invention, brief description of the drawings, detailed description of the invention, claims starting on a new page, and an abstract starting on a new page, then your drawings. The things that are optional would be if you've got a biotech example or application and you have uh, sequence listings or large tables in your computer, code, if you're including code, those would be um, extra. The other thing is if you're doing research, research for the government under an SBIR and you receive government money to develop the technology, then the government has rights to that and you have to disclose that in your application. Um, so there's a few things that, you, that are may not be applicable, but that's these you have to have. Now, caveat, there's no perfect example that I can find, but what you'll find is in this application from 13 to 35 has all those sections, okay, for the most part. So that's, I'll get, we're going to get more into detail in this application. If you want to look at the patent itself that issued off that, that starts on page, That starts on page 63. So from page 63 to the back is the actual application that is, or the patent that issued off that application. Now, some differences that you can take an obvious, uh, that's obvious off the front is this is now in column format. Instead of being single spaced, um, one column, it's now, I've double spaced, it's now 
you know, single space, two columns, the lines are numbered. On the front page, there's some bibliographical um, information up on the top. Um, I'm going to talk more about details of this. Um, but that's the actual application that exists in Office. Okay. Same, cat, same uh, headings for all the uh, categories that were enumerated in the application itself. Okay, so that's just a quick overview. Now let's talk, oh, by the way, the next two documents are the detailed rules on how you put that together. The formatting, the spacing, the headings of the, the, the paragraphs that you need, etc. All those rules are right here. This is just a summary. The one sheet is just a quick summary. This one gives you all the rules, including the drawings. So when you make drawings, how you make your, your indicia markings, the lines, how you label the elements, all of that is in detail in these two. So keep these two handy. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, if we did uh, do uh, this, uh, uh, this pattern in another country overseas, uh, in another place on the pictures, so is the, it's good for the pictures for, for the, that you did before? So I'm, I'm going to cover that. But uh, So the question is, um, if, if you're starting with an international application from another foreign country, and you yeah, want to make a domestic application of that? Do it. Yeah, like in my case, I did that. Uh, there is a projection on it, and I did it in another country, and I, I bought some building like that, and I took a picture, and I have part of the picture of it. So it's good to... So, so I'm not going to be an expert in whatever foreign country you filed in. All I can articulate to you here is the U.S. requirements. So you'd have to look at your drawings, look at your application, make it conform to the rules I'm going to talk over, and that'll make it um, conform to the U.S. law. Okay? All right, so... Yes. I, I just want to. I, I wasn't understanding. I understand 63 is what the actual application is. What then is the one on 13? Is that like a rough draft type of? No, oh, that's the application. They both are the application. Or the one on 63 is the one where the patent is filed. Then. The one on page 63 is the says patent, United then? States patent in the upper left corner. So that's the actual that's filed patent after it's done. Okay, because you had mentioned it was the application, so that's why I was wondering what the. One on 13 was. So this is the application 13, on 13. That's the application that you will submit. So this is the formatting. This is the patent that actually issued great. as a result of that. Great, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first big topic is what, what you need to address, and that is what I have. Is it patentable to begin with? Is it patentable subject matter? Okay. So we go back to that sentence in the Constitution, new and useful process machine manufacture composition matter. So as with anything in law, things were defined by humans, and then exceptions pop up. And so there's, you know, those, those get adjudicated in various formats, either through the patent office or ultimately through the courts. And the courts aren't really good at things like abstract material. Okay, they haven't really defined that, and the, the, the Congress hasn't defined it, so there's a number of areas that are gray there. What does that mean? Typically software patents and, and law of nature. So, what the Supreme Court have done in their review of cases, they've told us what it's not. Okay, they've come up with what are called judicial exceptions. So, a patent is not, you can't patent a law of nature, a, a natural phenomenon, or abstract ideas. So, anything that has to do with algorithms, formulas, um, metabolism by a human, anything like that that's naturally occurring, you cannot get a patent on. Now, does that mean you can't get a patent on a digital multimeter? No, it doesn't. You can get a patent on that because that is measuring a signal, an electrical signal, but you cannot patent an electrical signal. Okay? So, there's a lot of things that are defined as not patentable, and we're going to go into detail about this. It's also not printed matter or strategy. There's a carve-out in our strategy for reducing or avoiding taxes. Okay? <laughs> Somebody paid some big money, has some great lobbyists in Congress. All right. So you cannot, one of the main rules is what you can't do is preempt all fundamental principles in a field. Okay? And we'll talk more about that. Um, so it, it has to be basically, you can't just have insignificant activity, kind of data gathering activity, or be practiced by a series of physical acts. So, for example, if somebody had a process that they wanted to computerize, they can't just simply computerize it and say, oh, now it's patentable. Okay, it's not. That would be considered abstract material. 
So what happens is the claims have to impose meaningful limitations on the scope of the claim, and you consider that on the claim as a whole. These are just some basic ground rules where you get more deeper into the water. All right, your next sheet for testing patentable subject matter is that it's got four colored clouds on there on the front. I'm going to break this up on Yeah, All right. So let's look at the back side. Let's put the flow chart on. So when you submit an application to the patent office, they're going to actually go through this flow chart and say, you know, first step is this patentable subject matter. And this is this is the flow chart it goes through. Number one is the claim to a process machine manufactured of composite metal of metal. But the answer is no, right? By the Constitution and the U.S. Code, it's not patentable. By U.S. Code 35, 35. If it is one of those four, the next step is, um, it's called step 2A, is the claim directed to a law of nature, natural phenomenon, or an abstract idea? Okay, and those are the, they're called four judicial exceptions. If it is, if it is not directed to one of those, then it's patentable. If you go to the left, it's patentable. The next question is, if it is or possibly, the question is, does it cite significantly more? Are you claiming significantly more than just that judicial exception? And if the answer is no, it's not patentable. The answer is yes, it is. All right, what does this mean? If you turn the sheet over in those four categories, these are examples of what are called the judicial exceptions. The, this is what is not patentable. Okay? So, for example, in the upper left-hand corner, fundamental economic practices, you can't patent these. So... If you've got a, a, a program for hedging, right, for hedging investment risk, uh, creating contractual relationships, these are, these are specific cases that all went up to the, either the Federal Circuit or the Supreme Court and were ruled as non-patentable subject matter. Okay? Lower left, certain methods of organizing human activity. So managing a game of bingo, um, structuring a sales force or marketing company, using advertising as an exchange or currency, Again, all were very specific cases, went up and determined to be abstract, non-patentable. Upper right-hand corner, an idea of itself, so data recognition, uh, comparing data to determine a risk level. You know, you can think of that like, that was the classic computer program. You know, I input data, I sort data, I mask off a field, I see if it's between a couple of different values, strip those off, resort it, output it. That is not patentable. Those are standard programming practices that are used that are well known. Okay? And then of course in the lower right, mathematical relationships. So algorithms and that sort of thing are not patentable. So if your patent has something in those areas, and I'm going to teach you how to get around it, hopefully, is you have to add significantly more. That means you're caught in box 2A, 2B. Okay? So if, you, if you've got something that's patentable, it's typically going to be software or biotech if you're in that area, you're going to be stuck in 2B saying, how do I get over this? All right? So that's the first uh, test is patentable subject matter. All right. The next requirement, as long as you've got patentable subject matter, is utility. You have to be able to uh, show that your invention has utility. It has to be specific, substantial, and credible. And the tests are credible, and it has to be credible to one who's normally skilled in the art. So if you've got a mechanical device, would a mechanical engineer understand how you propose to make and use this? Would he be able to make this thing and use it? And would he look at this and say, aha, this is you know, a novel uh, invention? Um, it has to be substantial, not throw away in substantial use. And the uh, utility has to be specific, something real world. It's not, a, it's not a requirement that typically the patent office is going to deem your application on, but the importance of this is because it's statutorily required, is someday if, you're, if your patent becomes very valuable, people are going to be looking at ways to invalidate your patent. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to find out that you disclose utility. Okay, So make sure that you address this. The next step is what most people think of. And that is the novelty or non-obviousness. So in other words, have you got something that's new, new to the art? Right? So there's two types. Novelty means it distinguishes from the prior art. Right? So it's got to be different than the prior art, different than anything else 
that's prior disclosed, right? Also, it has to be unobvious. Unobvious means to one skilled in the art, if I was somebody, a skilled artisan, I could say, well, I see what you've done, but I could, com by combining patent A with patent B, it would be obvious to come up with what you did. Right? You just simply put two things together, there's no unexpected results, so as a result, you would probably get an obviousness rejection. Right? So you have to overcome novelty and obviousness. So for example, a new benefit to an old device is not patentable. So if, I, if you had a patent on a coffee maker, and I said, oh, that's really cool, but man, I want to use that as a tea brewer. Okay, same apparatus. It would not be patentable. It's the same thing. Um, you know, maybe it, maybe old school coffee maker, right? Maybe it had a, a, a percolator and you boiled it on the stove, and some of you may not even know what that means, but <laughs> right? You put the grounds up at the top and it percolates. I just wanted to put tea in there. It's the same apparatus. New use for that is not patentable. Um, if there are unexpected results, um, it's possible that uh, that you can get a method patent, right? There's, there's apparatus and there's method. A method patent is a process patent. For example, if you had a method patent for baking a cake, you would be acquiring a mixing bowl, you know, adding flour, adding two eggs, preheating the oven. It's a series of steps. That's a process patent or a method patent. So if you've got unexpected results, it's possible you can do that. Um, and then finally, if you simply have a method patent that has to do with healthcare, and there's no associated medical device or pharmaceutical or anything that goes with that, that's typically, that is not by law enforceable. We can't keep doctors from practicing their trade, okay? Okay, the next requirement after patentability and, and novelty and non-obviousness is you have to describe it in a written description. So in the patent, you have to satisfy the fact that you have possession of the claimed invention. So what that means is you have to describe it in sufficient detail that one who's ordinarily skilled in the art would know that you, in fact, have come up with this, that you understand it, and that you've articulated it so others could understand it. Right? You, that will be interpreted through the specification, the claims, the drawings, the entire application package is used to determine that you've met the written description um, requirement. Now, the level of detail varies. Okay, depending on the art. If it's a straightforward mechanical type of invention or electrical invention, normally in the industry there's very little experimentation. So you have to describe in fairly good detail exactly what's the construction, how does this apparatus, how is it put together, exactly how it operates. Other um, trades, such as maybe biotech, where there can be a lot of experimentation and it's expected within the art, they typically engage in experimentation, then the level of detail there doesn't have to be quite as high. Uh, so, as a result, um, I can tell you where it's inadequate, and where it's inadequate is if you use mostly what's called functional language in your claims to make the claim on what you're inventing, all right? And I'm going to talk a lot about that. Um, so what you have to do is you have to sufficiently identify how the function is performed or the result is achieved, right? So what's, what does that mean? That means in the claim, you typically are going to claim what's the structure, right? What does this thing look like? What are the elements? How do they go together? How do they rotate? How do they really align? Then in the specification is where you're talking about how that provides a function, okay? Um, so in software, does the specification explain what the hardware and software the inventor uses to accomplish the claim function. So software, because it's a lot of times you're facing the abstract issue, is you have to talk about the steps and the procedure. Okay? Be very specific about that. Um, so again, software is one of those trades that is very well is known in the art. And so as a result, software inventions do require a higher level of disclosure to meet the written requirement. So you would disclose the computer, the structure of the computer, the algorithms typically through flowcharts, okay? And you would even put the logical diagram of the computer. So very much you can describe it in detail. Um, and again, depending on the, uh, the art is what detail you need. 
The next requirement is what's called enablement. Very similar to written description, but slightly different. Enablement means that somebody who's normally skilled in the art, after reading your application, would know how to make and use your invention. Okay? So, what's the guidance? So the, gui the uh, direction needed to enable invention is inversely related to the amount of knowledge in the state of the art as well as predictability art. So again, kind of what I said before, right? So if the level of knowledge is high in the industry, all right, um, then that determines kind of the level of, um, of um, enablement that you would need. So complex experimentation is okay, right, like biotech, if the art typically engages in that. So the, so the test is, if they need experimentation, is it undue? Right? Is this something more than what somebody who was skilled in the art would do normally in experimenting? So if there is, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bridge that gap between their normal experimentation that they would do and what they would need to make your device, to make and use your device. You're just trying to bridge that gap. That's what you're trying to describe in the enabling requirement. Okay? You don't have to teach what's well known in the art. So if you're making some kind of a, oh, I don't know, housing for your device, you don't have to describe how the seams are welded or screwed or riveted or epoxied because somebody who's normally skilled in the art would know enough to know um, that. What you, have to, what you do have to go into detail on is what's the novelty, your particular points of novelty. And then there's some tests as to what the experimentation factors would be. So the next, the final um, requirement then is best mode. You have to disclose at the time of the application what you believe the best mode of your application is. So the other way of saying this is what is your preferred embodiment, okay? So um, typically in the specification, you might say, well, you know, in one embodiment, my device looks like, the device looks like this, it's made like this, arranged this way, operates this way, produces results. In an alternate embodiment, it's got this feature, and this is kind of what it does. In the preferred embodiment, it's got this, it looks like this, it's made like this, it's got these elements and does these results. So you're typically going to have multiple embodiments in your application. Again, the patent office is not going to check this and ding you on it, but if somebody wants to validate your patent later on and they find out you haven't disclosed the best mode, then they're going to go right after de uh, de trying to declare your patent as, you know, as um, um, Invalid. Okay, so that, that's it. Those are the requirements that you have to meet. So now let's go through and talk about putting together an application. So you follow the same sequence of steps. You first do a patentability determination to make sure okay, you have eligible subject matter. You can a chart. You want to do that. The next step is when, when you need to find references, um, you are supposed to include in your application references that are close to what you're inventing, but which you can distinguish from, okay? So what does that mean? That means you've got to go into and perform a search, right? So everybody's probably undertaken searches of some sort. This is the internet age. Most people know what the computer is now to do searching. Um, so what you do is you first define what is it, what's the invention, how does it work, what are the results. You generate some keywords out of all that. After that, you generate some synonyms because there's alternate ways of, of stating things. And then you put together your search streams and you start conducting searches. Okay? So that's a typical process. All right. So let's give them just a goofy example. What, what, what would we do? So the, we're well, on the second to the next page. I guess I did include one other sheet of 101 eligibility in there, so you can review that later. So the next sheet is a matrix. Or chart, matrix, if you will. And with this, let's just take a goofy example, right? So what we've got is an invention here. Uh, somebody said, well, you know, there's a there's a need in the art for somebody to be able to disable a fleeing suspect in their vehicle. So you know, our idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to have all the car manufacturers equip their cars with fuel shutoff solenoids and electrical, you know, kill switches. And then in the police cars, we're going to equip them with a, you know, little box, and it's got a dial on there, and you punch in some kind of identifying information and thing. You hit the button, and it'll save, send out a microwave or something, and, and disable that vehicle. Okay, goofy example. So 
that's what all that language refers to. So let's talk about how would we do a search based on that. So the first step would be on the first column uh, over on the left-hand side is we'd say, okay, well, what does this look like structurally? What are the elements of this invention? So, you know, it's got a receiver, it's got a valve, it's got a switch, it's got a transmitter. You know, start off kind of simple of the basic structure of the invention. The next step would be come up with some synonyms to those words because there's alternate ways of saying, you know, fuel solenoid and kill switch and transmitter. Come up with some ideas, right? And then after that, you narrow it down and you construct your search strings or you do your search. Now, the third, the last column here, if you're not familiar with Boolean search methods, those are what are called Boolean search strings, okay? They're not overly complicated if you want to learn them, just uh, Google Boolean and it'll teach you the rules. But if you use the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO.gov, they've got a couple of fields. And you can say keyword transmitter and, and you can say transmitter, let's just get this, transmitter and uh, fuel and shut off. And, and you can just keep anding terms, okay? And so that eventually will get you down because if you just did transmitter and you hit enter, you'd get, you know, six million patents, right? But transmitter and fuel, you know, that'll get it down to maybe 6,000. Transmitter, fuel, and shut off, and, you know, the more keywords that you add, you're going to begin to neck this down to a manageable number of references, okay? So that's the process. The really good news for you all down here uh, well, let me, let me get to that later. So that's how you would construct a search tree. Now, there's also, when we talked about the different sections within the, the uh, patent, right? So in this case, you can search, so you can search the title or the abstract or the spec or the claims separately. So a keyword like solenoid would not be in the title, right? Typically that title would be something like uh, you know, uh, method for disablement of a fleeing vehicle, right? That would be like the title. But the claiming would be the structure of the invention. So if you look, you might search the claim for the solenoid. You might search the title for, um, you know, uh, police apprehension or, you know, whatever words that would be. The abstract is 150 words, a little bit expanded on the title, that would contain something different. A spec would be kind of a broad-based search, the entire document. So first step is when you're using your keywords, generate your keywords, try to get it down what you want, and search specific sections of the application. And again, the reason you do that is because you want to get this down, your first searches are very general searches, you get in thousands. Right, you want to get this down to a manageable number, you know, 100, 200, something to start with that's much more manageable. The other thing is, let's take a look back at that issue patent. So back on page 63, which was that issue patent, on the left-hand column, if you scan those numbers down on the left, there's a number towards the bottom called 58. It says field of classification search on the left-hand side. Classifications uh, fields are what the patent office uses to categorize your application, right? So the application comes in, they pigeonhole it into some structure somewhere, right? Because there's a group that specializes in examining those and it also it's easier to find what's the prior art in that classification, right? So in this particular case, and, and we, there's, there's multiple class codes, you want to use CPC, so that's right under line 58. That's the Cooperative Patent Classification Code. So in this case, they classified it as a G06F8-425. Right? What does that mean? That means at the G level, it's probably physics. And at 06, it probably has to do with um, you know, electrical impl implementations of physics. And so as, it, as you add and get more resolution, the class code gets longer. So this is a very detailed class code. So if you were to go and actually look up that class code, geo 6 f 8 425 you would see a lot of inventions that would be very similar to this particular application, um, which actually is a software comprehensibility scoring uh, patent. Okay, so does that make sense? Now, why is that important? That's important because 
Now you can combine your text searches in the fields with class codes. Because solenoids and, flu and, and fuel shutoffs can be used in tractors, could be used in, you know, I don't know if they're used in lawnmowers yet, but you know, you can use it in practically anything. So you don't want those kinds of structures. You want them, you want it to be just in the in the apparatus that you're inventing. So by combining class codes with keywords, you're going to get a much more tailored, very focused search. And then finally, you can use also, if you like, citation. You don't have to. I would certainly instruct you to start here, include class codes. If you want to take an extra step, what is citation? In this same patent on 63, starting at the bottom of the left-hand column, it says references cited. What that means is, in this particular application, the examiner said, oh, even though you submitted these references you thought were similar, here's the ones I think are relevant. So that gets published along with your patent. So you may go down and, once you find some really close patents, go take a look at some of those reference, those cited patents, to see if they're also relevant to your application. All right? So that's the search. So, yes? What is the advantage to include references um, and, or not in the in the patent application? Well, you you have to disclose. So if you don't disclose references, somebody later on could say um, that, that you really didn't disclose to the patent office things that you knew. Okay. Okay. And so you could be accused of. Um, I don't want to say committing fraud on the patent office, but there's some other terms that that basically it's a rule that you do a search before you before you turn in an application. So, and, and quite frankly, this the second reason is, is what I consider the better reason. You're going through this process and you want an issue patent for a reason. Okay, you're trying to keep competitors out of your market. You're trying to create a valuable asset for your company. If you submit irrelevant references. Then, and the patent examiner, for whatever reason, doesn't find the most relevant references because, after all, they're humans just like you. Um, although they've been doing this for a long time. Later on, um, let's say they do find references, or somebody challenges your patent and does find other references that are closer. Well, now you're kind of in a dichotomy because your patent either is waiting to be issued through the examiner, or it's issued and somebody's challenging it, and now suddenly there's art out there that looks like is prior to your art. You don't want that to happen. So you really want to surface the best references that you can find. Um, one more question kind of on that, on that subject. Mm -hmm. There's a gazillion million patents that are out there right now. How do Not a gazillion. You, how, do you, how, do you, <laughs> how do you determine that what you're actually patenting is enough of a difference that it is novel and unique after, after searching this? Um, so it has to be, it has to distinguish from the prior art the requirements that I read before. Yeah. So it has to be different than what's out there. So the structure has to be different. And in addition, it has to be non-obvious to one who's normally skilled in the art. All right. So that, that's, that's what by statutorily is required. So the process is, it, once you go through a determination, you say, yes, it distinguishes. Here's my references. It's different than all these. It's not obvious according to any of these. You submit. The examiner will then examine it. He'll come up with his his results as a result of following the same requirements. Okay, and I'll, we'll talk about what happens when there's disagreement on that. Okay. 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 So, um, if this if if this, this thing sounds a little daunting, don't let it be. What I tell people is, you know, how do you? What's the angel saying? How do you eat an elephant? We well, eat it one bite at a time. Okay. So just start with small chunks in order to do this. So your, your searches are continuously iterative. You're not going to throw in, come up with a set of search terms, 15 minutes later come up with the most appropriate references. This is going to take some time, as all research does. Okay? It shouldn't take that long. It's mostly the time is going to be you figuring out, if you're not that schooled in, in searching, is how do I construct my search strings, how do I then refine the searches, that sort of thing. Now, with respect to um, class codes, the good news is USPTO will help you find a class code. If you go to the USPTO.gov, they've got inventors uh, help center there, call them up, explain what you're trying to invent, they'll help you come up with the closest class codes. There may be several, they may give you several class codes to look under, 
but they're that helpful. And let me tell you, there's one thing that you all have here as a resource that I wish I had in Albuquerque, I'm sure a lot of us wish I had, and that is you've got actually um, Patent and Trademark Resource Center here in New Mexico State. This is fantastic. Okay, so these sheets are right over there. I'm taking one. You guys grab whatever you can grab. But you've got access to PubEast and PubWest that we don't have. So I have to use either a private database or go use USPTO.gov, their external site, to get access to their internal sites here. So fantastic resource. Okay. Um, in addition, so I talked about searching basically other patents. You also search other applications. So under the USPTO.gov, you click on one link to go search applicate, or, uh, patents, issued patents. There's another link that you uh, click to go search pending applications. Okay? Now, typically, barring no other elections by the inventor, applications publish in 18 months. So what does that mean? That means you've got an 18, at least an 18 month blind spot that you don't know what somebody's applied for yet. Right? Because it takes 18 months to publish. So if you're looking at applications, you won't see anything unless it's at least 18 months old. The other thing you want to do is search other literature, go to websites, because anything is prior art. If somebody's already selling your product, and it's got all your elements in it that you're trying to patent, you're not going to get a patent office, a, a, a patent on this. Right? So make sure you can go to trade magazines, sometimes you go to trade shows, that sort of thing. I would, I would advise conducting an exhaustive search because, again, you know, to the, to the prior question, presenting the best available references will lead to a stronger patent on your part. Those 18 months are, at any given point, do you know if it's approved or you just wait 18 months to see whether or not USPTO decided that it, it was patent so at the end? So the process is you apply for a patent, and they examine it, which is a process. You get a first office action, second office, the final office action. If you survive all that, issue patent. The length of that time that that takes can take anywhere from, um, well, let me say it can take from a year, and I'll talk about that later, all the way up to, I mean, there's some that have taken four, five, six years. That's not the norm. I would say the norm for a simple mechanical electrical device might be on the order of, two and a half to three years. If you've got a, something in an art that's really backed up, it might take three plus years. But I think they're getting that backlog um, managed well. The 18 months is, is when you submit your application, it's going to publish for the world to see in 18 months. Okay, so it's in secret until 18 months and then it publishes. And we can look it up on the computer. At whatever stage. We can look at that entire package and see what all the forms you submitted, the application that you submitted, everything is on available on the computer. Now you can elect non-publication, but what you would give up would be the right to file international, typically. Yes? Is that 18 months starting with the uh, non-provisional, or would it include the provisional if you did that first? Right, so it, it goes against the priority date. Correct. So if you're taking priority from a provisional, then it would be 18 months. Okay. Um, so what do you do is you're going to um, evaluate your references. And people ask, well, how many do I use? Do I use five? Do I use six? Do I use 12? It depends on the art, how crowded that field is. And I liken this to um, homesteading real estate. Right? So if there was a piece of land out there and you thought, hey, there's nobody out here. I want to homestead this. You first have to go out there and figure out, well, who's got that piece and that piece and that piece so that you can define what you're homesteading, right? Well, it's the same kind of thing with patent. It's kind of like real estate. So what you want to do is you want to evaluate all these references. So what you want to do is you want to look and see what those have disclosed and what they're claiming. Now, if it's a really crowded art field, you may need, and you know, I hate to throw numbers, but I mean, you may need a dozen, 15, 20 references that you submit. It's a really crowded art field. Okay. Depending on your novelty, how focused it is, and how close everybody else is to claiming something around that point, that piece of novelty. If it's a wide open field that's, that's you know, not many people have had patents issued, you wouldn't need as many. Maybe get away with you know four to six references. So I would I would make sure that you get down to at least you know 
at least say five or so references. You know, it would be kind of a bare minimum for you. Right? Okay, so what's our first step? We've done the search, um, we've come up with some references, so the next step is, uh, this would be the order that I would advise you to prepare your application in. The first step, I think, is the most difficult for the layperson because this is patent law and involves a different way of articulating your invention than what you might be used to. So start with the claims, then the drawings, and then for the most part, after that, things will fall out. The mistake that I have in working with, with my clients is they'll start writing right away. And the claims aren't done. So then we're going to go back and modify the claims, and we'll modify the claims, and we have to modify the written description, and back and forth. And, and then you're trying to you know, fix something that is just horribly out of sync. So start with the claims, then the drawings, and then what will happen is you do the detailed description next, and basically you just take a copy of your claims, put it in this section, and then just start articulating, like I talked about before. In one embodiment, it's got these elements, they're constructed like this, they operate like this, rotate this way, interact in this fashion, and they produce these kinds of results in another embodiment, etc. So you just simply take the claims and just kind of expand out on that in more lay terms. Okay? The background is something you know, all right? You've been trying to solve this problem forever, you've tried all these different things, you've looked at the commercial off-the-shelf solutions, you know, none of them seem to be you know, solve the problem that, you know, you're trying to solve. Um, within that, you, you put what's called the field of the invention description of the related arts. The field of the invention is just a quick sentence that just tells the patent office, they use that sentence to determine what, where to assign it within the patent office, okay? So this general, this invention generally relates to the same one of the vehicles um, uh, as they're running down the street, they're driving down the street. Description of related art, here's where you describe your half dozen or so references. Don't denigrate the references, just simply say patent number this, uh, discloses this, claims that. This other patent discloses this other approach, but don't say it's a horrible patent, don't denigrate the art. Yes? Is there a maximum amount of references that you can put? There's not a maximum amount, but I, I don't think you want to be too unfocused. Okay. I mean, you want to make sure that they're all very focused on, you know, what you need to do is think about What's the exact point of novelty? Really put some thought into what's the real point of novelty that I come up that's different? And when you kind of focus in on that, again, that will limit the number of references that you'd use. Okay? Um, a brief summary of the description, that's simply a summary of this, the detailed description. Description of the drawings, you'll see in these applications. And, and you, you know, that's why I give you this copy of this application, you'll see it. The description of the drawing just said, you know, figure one shows the frontal view of the da, da da figure two shows, you know, the exploded view of the, you know, articulating arm element, etc. Um, and then the title and the abstract. So if you do it in this order, that's going to be the simplest, most effective order. Okay, so claims. What are the requirements for claims? Claims have to particularly point out and distinctly claim, right? Um, it starts on a new page. And it starts with what is claimed is. Couple pages. See that on the application. And there's two types of claims. There's independent claims and dependent claims. They both have the same format. The independent claim, they both have preamble transition in the body. So for the independent claim, an example would be a resistor. That's the preamble. Transition would be comprising. And then a body would be a ceramic core, a coating of carbon on the core, and a strip of copper at the end of each core, period. It's one sentence. That's, that's an independent, let's call that claim one, independent claim one. A resistor comprising, and then what is comprised of, period. Now, in that transition language, there was other words. I just picked out the first one. I said comprising, right? There's others. For 99% of you, maybe even more, use the word comprising. Okay? Comprising means it, um, it's open. It's called an open term, which means it includes the elements that you talk in combination with unrecited elements. I'll explain what that means. The flip side is consisting of, which is closed. That means no more, no less. So an example, if I want to write a claim for a writing implement, okay? 
So I would, if I wanted the broad coverage, I would say um, a writing implement comprising a barrel, an ink reservoir, a dispensing tip at the tip of the reservoir, okay, and leave it at that. If I use the word comprising, it's open, which means if somebody else made, had a barrel, an ink reservoir, a dispensing tip, and a pocket clip, they would still infringe me because they had the first three elements. Okay? If I said consisting of, and I only included those three elements, and they added these, then they get around me. Right? So the key is, is you want the minimum number of elements to make it operable. Okay? Because if it's not operable, it's, it's indefinite. So you wouldn't just claim and say, ah, I can trip them, I'll just claim a barrel with uh, an ink reservoir in it. Well, it doesn't work, it's not operable. So to make it operable, you have to have all, at least the bare number, number of elements, and then use the word uh, comprising. Does that make sense? There are occasions when you would use consisting, but chances are you're going to be using an open-ended term for the transition. All right. <coughs> Next page in your package. Um, it actually starts off. It says broad claim, narrow claim, issue claim. But I'm. Uh oh. You didn't double sign it. Okay, that's all right. You're just gonna have to view up here. That's okay. I can get you this. So what this is, if you can see, this looks like a golf club head, right? Well. It's a real invention, patent number 4,173,57, all right? The difference is what they've done is they've hollowed out the head of the driver so that it'll accept like a shotgun cartridge, okay? You have a firing pin on the side that faces the face. So as you tee up your ball and you come up to the fairway there in a 500-yard hole, you swing back and the minute that firing pin hits the ball, it blows off, does that have a shot in it, just the, the, just the, uh, the, the charge. And hopefully your ball goes down and lands on the on the green, right? It's a real patent. So we got it. I don't know if they ever made these. I'd like to find this out on the market. Uh. What I've given you on the back are hypothetical, actually the first the top two are hypothetical claims, how you might go approach claiming them. It is your package, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. So do some some people do have and some people don't? I know why. I had somebody in the office that normally is involved in this make extra copies. So you've got my card, send me an email, or, or maybe we can get somebody else to copy there who's maybe in the office. In any case, you get the idea. This is just what you're missing here is this sheet right here is the back side of this. So let's look at what a broad claim would look like. So at the top, a broad claim hypothetically could be a device for accelerating an object comprising a mass for striking the object and a propellant charge associated with said mass for accelerating said mass. Okay, that meet the definition of broad. Um, probably too broad because this could encompass rockets or anything else. So what would happen is the examiner would go find and search, you know, Minuteman missile or whatever. He'd find some other art. He'd say, you know, reject. Reads on this other art. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the narrow claim, you can read from that, obviously very narrowly defines exactly the structure of what you see on this page. So, the goal of the patent what would be really nice is if you could get broadly issued patents, right? That way you can exclude people from doing anything near what you're doing. Not always practical, depending on how crowded the field is, etc. You may, have, you may have to resort to getting very narrow claims. All right? If other people have claimed a lot of that real estate and all that's left is that little piece, then a narrow claim would get you that piece. All right? But if that's sufficient for you, that's what you go after. The strategy, what you do, is you put together both broad claims, narrow claims, and we'll talk about independent claims as well, because what you're trying to do is get feedback from the examiner, from the patent office, on where he saw the related art, and where, he, and, and you're going to get by reading the tea leaves what he's willing to allow, right, to be patentable. So these are, the top two are hypothetical. But the bottom <coughs> one is is actually what issued. That was the first independent claim that issued on this. It's a means plus what's called a means plus function claim. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, they're, they're very difficult for the beginner. I wouldn't advise that. Um, 
like, if you need specific advice, we can talk about that. But for a beginner, what I would advise is hang on to this sheet, and as you're thinking through your invention, try to write the narrow claim on your invention. Because it's much easier to write the narrow claim than go back and broaden it. Okay? So I've noticed that this doesn't mention the word golf anywhere in there. Is that intentional? Well, golf would be the application of the yeah, invention. Right? Okay. That's the use. Yeah. Right? So making between... tea, making coffee, playing okay. golf. What about a baseball bat? What about a hockey stick? So it's the apparatus <coughs> that you're protecting, not the use. Okay. Okay. So this, I already went through this. That's the broad claim, that's the narrow claim, and the issue claim. All right, now let's talk about the independent claim. The independent claim is the same structure as the independent claim, but with one difference. It says the resistor of claim one, right, that thing we just claimed in claim one, further comprising, right, a solder bump covering the copper at the end of each core. So we added one thing to it, we restricted it. We added one new restriction, one new element to it. That narrows that claim one. So in case claim one doesn't get through because there was prior art on it, claim two might get through. Okay, and this is just the format that the patent office has used. So same structure, but if you're referencing back to a prior claim, still has a transition that says further comprising or where in or something, and then you're added, added elements. Okay, so get behind here. All right, claim content. So again. The subject of the patent is the mechanical means or the device. It's not the it's not the application of it. Okay. Um, so what you want to mention is the shape, the material, the orientation. You'll see that all in that example. Um, and so you want to talk about structurally, physically, or functionally, so it's connected to, or communicates with, actually aligned with. You'll read that in that example, that golf example. Right. Use that kind of terminology, so that what I tell people is, I could read that claim and already know kind of what it looks like before I even look at the picture, the drawing, in a, in a very narrow plane. Now obviously you couldn't do that in a very broad plane, but that's the idea, right? Because at the end of the day, when this becomes issued and somebody challenges you or you're looking to challenge somebody else for infringement, is you read the claims and it's what they're doing infringing your claims, right? So that's why it has to be defined at that level. Um, okay, you can use some other words to talk about uh, kind of how the elements cooperate, uh, but you've got to be a little bit careful with what's called relative terminology. So words like similar, about, essentially, approximate, you can see would lead to, okay, well, is that infringing or not? Is that, you know, close to? Is it approximate? What would constitute approximate? Then you get into kind of what would one who's skilled in the art think is approximate? So you want to kind of generally avoid those terms, right, unless they're well known in the art, right? Don't use functional language, right? This is what most people struggle with. So I've hammered down the structural approach to this, right? You read that claim, it's very structural. I know exactly the elements, how they go together, how they're shaped, how they articulate. You, you can use functional language. I'm not saying you can't, but you've got to be very careful, and you certainly can't define your, your invention functionally. In the extreme, you cannot define your invention by the problem that it purports to solve. You're trying to claim a device. So, um, one who's skilled in art must know the structure or steps claimed. So if you try to claim it said a microprocessor program to sort search results. Okay, so you see the problem of that claim? It just tells it, it they're they're preempting any other way of programming a microprocessor. They would preempt anybody else from being able to do this. They define it functionally by what it does, it's sorting search results. So what you want to do is you, you want to define that microprocessor structurally. How is it put together? Logically, what is it coupled with? What is the algorithm it goes through? You have to di distinctly define what you're claiming, not claiming an end result. Right? That's indefinite. That makes sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll learn more. All right. So in the extreme, purely functional claiming is indefinite um, because it's very broad. So another example would be 
an apparatus configured to receive a satellite signal, process the signal to detect a synchronization indicator, extract the synchronization indicator, and display a synchronization indicator on display. Does that tell you how they did it at all? Do you know what the structure of that would be? You can't, you can't tell. And, and in fact, they would be preempting anybody else from being able to put together a system, no matter how they processed the signals, extracted the signals, received it, etc. It's just too broad, it's indefinite. So that was not good? That's not good, it was indefinite. Too, it was functional. It was defined functionally. So you can use functional language, you know, typically you can use it maybe at the end. What it's more used is, is adding context. Um, if it, one who's skilled in the art would know uh, that functionally how you're defining it, would know what this means in terms of structure, then it is allowable. But for those that are new to this, I would suggest staying away from the functional claiming. Try to start with structure first. Okay? And we can always help you with some of the other ones. Okay, you can also, you want to avoid uh, negative claiming, right? So you would say, you wouldn't say not D. You wouldn't say what you're not claiming. But you may want to say, well, not in excess of a certain number of components or elements or percentage or something. The other area that people get tripped up in, any English majors here? So you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, antecedent basis. So you introduce your elements, so right? So that, that resistor, a resistor comprising, you know, a a lead at each end, a solder, whatever it had on there. You introduce all the terms in the indefinite, a or an. Then when you refer to it later, it's the. So remember in that first claim, it was a resistor comprising da da da. Claim two was the resistor claim one further comprising. So that's a proper antecedent introduction. Introduce with a or an, and then subsequently it's the or said. You don't have to worry about said, just do the. So, if you go back and you go back to that golf club, the narrow example, I put in blue here, in blue bold, everywhere where an element was introduced. So there was a lot of elements introduced here. They were all introduced, they were defined, they were shown where they were, how they, you know, how they were aligned, located, etc. Then when they were referred to subsequently, the... Okay, so if you don't do it in this fashion, if you don't introduce the indefinite further and then refer to in the definite, you're going to get what are called 112 rejections, right? And they're going to force you to go back to this format. So I see a lot of people having trouble with this, so just remember that. You can have alternatives, so not just in the chemical arts, but even mechanical arts. If you can say, well, this is comprised of elements either A, this can be selected from the group of A, B, C, or D. It could be four different things that's used for this either this fastening method or whatever. Um, you can say where an R is A, B, C, or D. So you can do that kind of thing in the claim. If there are um, more than one element, you can say, well, there's a range, a percentage of A, a range for B, a range for C. Just make sure the ranges don't add up to more than 100%. What you don't want to do is put multiple ranges within one claim. So that example would be, maybe it was a, maybe we're baking a, I don't know, we're tempering some metal or something. So, you know, where a temperature had to be between 45 degrees and 78 degrees Celsius, but preferably between 50 and 60, right? Preferably in this window, but it could be in this window. That's indefinite, right? So when you go to claim, you say, well, which range are you talking about? What you would do is in your independent claim, you would make an independent claim that said within this window, and then you could pay, make a dependent claim to that prior claim and say, where in the temperature range is this, right? So maybe there was some prior art that had some temperature ranges out there that were different, and you thought, well, I'm not sure if I can get it, but you put that range in the independent, and then in the dependent, further restrict it, and you'll see what, what issues. Um, sometimes beginners will be over uh, narrow, so instead of using a screw or a nail or a rivet or a weld, it's better to put, you know, it's fastened or it's attached or a fastening element, right? Try to broaden your terms a little bit. 
you can list a work piece. So maybe if you're inventing a lathe, you can talk about the you know the the work piece, right? For making a, a lamp or the piece of wood that you're turning, you can refer to that. It's okay, but that's not the focus of the apparatus that you're claiming. And then keep in mind that whatever you disclose but don't claim is dedicated to the public. Disclose means you put it in your specification, either in the description, but then if you don't claim it, your claims, it's dedicated to the public. That's why I start with the claims. Start with the claims and then write your spec. So the claim types are either, I've talked about this a little bit, you know, device claims or process or method claims. So machine, device, the system, or apparatus claims. Method claims are the steps that, are, that you have to cite. So making a cake, if you wanted to have a method patent for making a cake, it'd be acquiring a mixing bowl, you know, adding two cups of flour, adding um, how much sugar? A cup of sugar, okay. a cup of sugar, and whatever you put in there. They all have the gerund form, I-N-G, that's how you know it's a series of steps, right? That's a method patent. So doing this, doing that, doing another thing, period. Yes? Can you have multiple dependent claims off of a single independent claim? You can have, the answer is yes, and there's different types. You can have an independent claim, you can have a dependent claim that refers to that, you can have another dependent claim that refers to that, you can have a dependent claim that refers back to a dependent claim, which of course refers to that. You can even have a dependent claim that refers back to this claim or this claim. That'll cost you. Okay, but you can do it. Uh, what you don't want to do is miss statutory classes, okay? So here's a real example that was tested, uh, I don't remember if this is the Federal Circuit or the Supreme Court, this was a claim that had to do with um, a way of switching your cell phone from one tower to the next as you're driving down the freeway, okay? And so the claim was a mobile base station for use of the network, including first base station, second base station, and she's a handover from the first base station to the second base by storing, folding, initially maintaining, initially causing the internet. See what they did? They started off with a device, a mobile workstation. They didn't say a method, they didn't say a process. They say a device, and then they defined it as a series of like a method. So you can claim the apparatus, you can claim the method, but don't do it in the same claim. Okay. Yeah. How many claims can you have? Or? I'll get to that. You getting anxious? I'm sorry. All right. So composition matter claims. These are the different types of claims. Um, these are things in composition matter, chemical arts, pharmaceutical, things like that. So you're, you're talking about um, you know, different materials that you're combining in order to arrive at what your novel invention is. It doesn't matter. The ingredients don't have to be novel. It's the end result, right? What's your final composition that's novel? So that would be what's called the composition of matter. So it would be a composition of matter comprising. Um, process by pro product by process claims are really not used very much. I won't worry about that. Kit claims you might use if you're if you've got a device maybe for oh I don't know joining pieces of uh, um, I don't know you're framing a house and you've got some new method of joining the rafters at the at the beam right and so that would entail some brackets and nails special screws maybe whatever you had you could patent the invention and maybe you sell the kit at Home Depot so you might claim a kit. So there's no structure, you just have these parts that people would buy in a blister pack or something. Uh, Jepson claims I won't get into, or in combination claims. The means plus function, that's the only, I'm just going to cover this very quickly. Means plus function came as a result of a case, I believe with Halliburton in the 50s. And they tried to claim something by using a means for doing something. Sounds very functional, right? It actually made it through. And as a result, um, there's very specific rules about what's called a means plus function claim. So what you would claim is a means for doing something comprising, blah, 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 elements, steps, whatever processor or product is. But what happens is a means for doing this, that still doesn't tell a structure, I don't know how it's made. So what the examiner, what he'll do is he'll immediately, as soon as he determines it's a means plus function claim, He'll go back to the spec, he or she will go back to the spec and say, okay, what is disclosed in the spec as that means? 
and that's all you're going to get protection around. Versus if you put the structure in the claims, you're going to get what's called equivalence, the doctrine of equivalence, which is a broader interpretation. Okay? So you're better off really not resorting to means plus function, but you will see them when you start doing your, your results, you're going to find this means plus function. So you can to cover that. Well, they're very difficult to do. If you need help with them, I can help you with them, but probably you should stick with regular apparatus claims with structure. Um, so there's certain words that trigger it. I won't get into this detail. Um, some things, just to tell you kind of how difficult it is, there are certain terms, and again, these are all adjudicated in the courts, that immediately invoke a means plus function interpretation. Um, others don't. So circuit does, but alarm circuit doesn't. You know, there's a court case that says this. And then there's others that are kind of like, well, we don't know, it just depends. So it, it's, you have to have been doing this for a number of years to, uh, to really get that straight. So what's the takeaway uh, for things like computer, if you have a computer application, is don't focus on the abstract data. Um, don't tie up the abstract data preventing others from practicing, right? All those ones that preempt it, those very broad, functionally defined claims, you can't do that. So usually, a computer technology, you're either, for the most part, what you're trying to do, if you can, is show that you're solving a technology issue. Okay? That's one way of getting the software playing through. Um, so improvements to the technology itself, um, improvements to the functioning of the computer itself, um, additional structure beyond a generic computer, all right, that helps solve the problem. There used to be a transformation test, and that's still part of the test. Um, make sure that you show limitations other than what is well understood and routine and conventional in the art. Simply limiting it to a particular field of use is not, is not enough. Just by saying, well, this is only used for, you know, whatever it's used for, a particular field, it's not, that doesn't limit it or make it non-abstract. Okay, so here's an example. Um, DDR Holdings had to do with the direction of somebody looking at a website. And so if somebody was at your website and they um, were looking at a particular product that you sold or something, you know, maybe if they were to click on that, it would take them, it would redirect them to another website. It would look different to them. If somebody came up with this DDR Holdings came. Um, I think they were the They came up with a, with, a, with a server. They would basically, as soon as you clicked on that object, it would recreate your website, including that other product off the other website, so that you never, they never lost you. It, it looks still the same. It was your still look and feel of your website, etc. So that was that was upheld. Those claims were upheld because they solved. A, they were able to convince the courts they solved a particular technology issue that was inherent in how what how the web worked. Okay, so it wasn't you know we read data, we sorted data, we masked off a certain bit, we resorted and outputted. That's not patentable. By solving a technology issue, they were able to convince the patent office that it was it was patentable subject matter. Very similar instance here. This had to do with. Um, further refinements of a GPS design that allowed you to triangulate or get a location in very weak signal areas that the current technology just didn't allow. They were able to modify that technology and gain location into weak signal areas. So again, they solved a technological issue. That issue is a pattern and is a pattern. So the thing you need to ask with software is, are you solving a business problem or a technical problem? If you're solving a technical problem, I would say you're home free. Write a good application, you're home free. If it's a business problem, you're going to have to add significantly more, right? According to that patent chart that we went over, the one eligibility. Um, you can't not simply just be automating. So you see the, um, the reader needs to be able to understand the structure. Um, and you've got to show your algorithm. So if we were to look at... Um, Yeah, I'm sorry. So if we go back to the patent application, look at page 34 to 35. In the package. Yeah. 
So this is, this. by the way, this application and issue patent is an IBM patent. So if you've got something in the software world, you'd be best advised to take a really close look at this patent. So in their drawings, you can see what they've done is they've articulated in figure one kind of the, um, the logical diagram, right, of how the system is put together, what are the elements of it. Figure two is the algorithm. What specific algorithm is the software executing in order to accomplish this novel invention? And then three is the hardware. Right? And honestly, if you look at this, there's nothing, you know, too unique about the hardware. It looks like a standard computer. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to get software patents. And by the way, this patent is a means of, I uh, got the title, but it, uh, giving a comprehensibility score for software. So what this was, was if you wrote some code, you wrote a program, you submit it into this program, it reads through it and determines a comprehensibility. It puts a comprehensibility score to it, right? The quality of the code. Sounds like pure software, right? And pure software typically has been, you know, recently thrown into question as to whether it's patented. Well, I'm here to tell you it is. Pat IBM is getting patents issued left and right, among other folks. But you have to be detailed. You have to show these kinds of drawings. You have to articulate, okay, how exactly your um, your structure accomplishes um, the novelty that you're inventing. Let's see what else. Uh, that's it. Okay, somebody asked about how many claims do I get? So you get up to 20 claims at $400, right? That $400 application fee is a micro-entity applicant, $400, 20 claims. Up to three of those can be independents. So you can have three independents and what would that leave? Another almost uh, five for each one, five, five or so for each one. Some people just need one independent, right? You could have maybe the apparatus would be one independent. A method with a method of using that apparatus could be another independent. You can have a system. You can have something else. So those would be the three independents. If you need more, extra claims over twenty is twenty bucks. Unless it's an independent, those are one hundred five. So those are more. But I've not found anybody I've worked with so far that really needs. People have submitted. I've seen applications people put forty or fifty claims in. But honestly, I think they were throwing the kitchen sink at it. I think if you sit down and really look at the novelty of what you're claiming, compared against the prior art, 20 claims is adequate. And then finally, um, so then once you've done your claims, you want to make your drawings. That's the next step. Uh, the requirement is they have to be readable, reproducible, and permanent. And, and actually, the, the main requirement is for drawings is they're required, if necessary, to understand your invention. But I'm here to tell you, the Patent Office, for the most part, they are mandatory, unless you get something that is not able to be reproduced. Drawing. So even software, your drawings are flow diagrams, logical diagrams, physical diagrams. Okay? So you definitely want. Typically, you're not going to use photos or color. If you do need it, you can petition for it. It costs you extra money, but black and white is all that you need. Um, right, so that's patent office requirement for necessary to understand the invention. Um, they may look at your drawings and declare them informal if they don't meet the strict requirements, right? So I've given you that page that tells you, you know, how the drawings have to go together. If they don't meet those, you may get um, an, an action that says, hey, your drawings are informal. You've got, you know, two months to correct them. So don't let a formal drawing uphold, you know, pull back your application. I would say put some sketches in there and get it in, and then you've got two more months to prepare the formal drawings if necessary. Uh, the drawings have to contain every feature that you're claiming, okay? So what does that mean? What I tell people is look at all the nouns in your claims. So if there's a noun in your claim, put that item in your drawing. So every element in the drawing should be in the claim and vice versa. Every, every element in your claim should be in the drawing. Talk about software. Uh, they're not dimensionable. These things will be... And they're not to scale because people will photocopy them, blow them up, shrink them, whatever. So there's not dimensions on there. Um, if there's dimensions that are critical, I can't think of why, but if there are, uh, maybe there are some clearances or other things, you put that in the written description. Um, and and I, I always advise people, 
do a lot of drawings. Make sure that the drawings completely articulate all aspects of it because you can use those, you'll be using that later on to modify your application, get around certain rejections. If you don't have those drawings in at first and you have to add them later, which you can do, if they're not new matter, you can add them later, but they can't be used to overcome enablement rejections or interpret the scope of the claim. So plenty of drawings up front is advisable. Okay, so you've done the claims, you've done the drawings, now it's time to draft the specification. How did I say to do that? Remember, just take a copy of the claims, put that into your, in your detailed description of the spec, and just start expanding. Okay? Um, if you use means plus function, you have to provide supporting structure, right, because the examination office is, once they see means plus function, they're going to go back to the spec. Um, so if you've got any kind of non-conventional, essential, or critical elements, you have to make sure and describe that. Okay. Um, you don't need to disclose for what's well known to someone who's skilled in the art. Um, and that's where you would correlate the structure of the invention to the function is in the spec. A lot of people try to put too much into the claim saying, oh, it works like this, it works like that. It's got the zone. It doesn't go in the claim. The claim is about the structure of the device, the apparatus. The specification is where you say it operates like this, it provides this function, and used in this way. Uh, you're going to satisfy the written description. Remember we talked about showing that you had possession of the claimed invention to the one who's skilled in the art. Now you can, uh, if you've actually made one of these, the idea is that you don't have to have necessarily reduce this to practice. You don't have to have made your invention to qualify for an application. Okay? As long as you can, reductive, reduction to practice, as long as you can you know, prophetically describe and meet all those requirements, okay, to, to showing to one who's uh, skilled in the art that you possess the invention, how to make it use, as long as you can do that from your mind, you can write a patent application, okay? If you've actually reduced the practice, you, you can um, articulate that in the application. That's the only case in which you can use uh, past tense. So otherwise you would use future tense. Enablement, so uh, disclosing to one uh, who's normally skilled in the art how to make and use the invention. Um, like I mentioned before, alternative embodiments, right, in your specification, configured this way, operates like this, what it does. Remember, to keep the best mode, right? Um, We'll go into Marcouche groupings. This is kind of the alternatives. We talked about that earlier. Um, be careful with um, items like essential, required, um, critical. The thing about that is you're going to put it in an application. You're going to say it's made of A and B, and it's critical that you know C and D are in there. And you've got some references. And the examiner looks at it and he finds some references to a C and D aren't novel. There's still ways you can amend around it. The problem is you said C and D were critical, right? So now you're putting yourself in the position of having to backtrack as to putting that in. So just be careful of using this kind of language. Um, already talked about this. You can use past tense if you've already reduced it to practice. Otherwise, use future tense. The patent office will interpret your claims under what's called the broadest reasonable interpretation. So, again, like that golf club example, if you submitted that one broad claim, they're going to say, okay, this is really is claiming all this area. And the reason they do that is because they're trying to find any infringing art, right? Any prior art. So that's the goal of the patent office. Interpret it broadly um, just to make sure that you're not uh, overlapping other IP. And then the best mode, you have to disclose the best mode. Don't hide, no trade secrets. You know, to the earlier point, just make sure you'll have, you ultimately come up with a stronger path. Okay. Um, don't include theory, kind of for the same reason that I talked about talking about something that's overly critical or essential. Same kind of thing with if you include theory in your specification, turns out theory's you know, proven wrong, and you're kind of in the position of having to backtrack. That's not easy. Okay, then after that, you draft your abstract. It's 150 words. 
probably easiest to just take that first independent claim and expand on that in kind of lay language. And you'll see the abstract in those patents. They're pretty straightforward. Something that more of a layperson can read, and it's on a separate sheet. So now you're done. That's your application, right? You did the search. You came up with references. You drafted claims, drawings. Did the specification. Now you just need, because we're dealing with the federal government, you have to add lots of forms to it. Uh, one's called the application data sheet. So that first, in our package here, the application data sheet is pages one through. Eight. The thing you want to be really careful of is if you have co-inventors, everybody has to sign the application data sheet. If you're a single inventor, okay, if you're the only inventor to this, then you fill this out, all these pages I'm talking about. But if you have co-owners or co-inventors, they also must sign this. Okay? Um, also, if you file the provisional. On the application data sheet, it is now mandatory that you make your claim for priority. Um, and it's on the bottom of page five. And there's two sections here. There's domestic benefit national stage information. So if you have a provisional, you would fill that in right there, where it says application number continuity type, you'd say provisional. Or if you had a foreign patent. Right? If you wanted to use that as a priority document, you would fill that in here. If you don't do that, you're not going to get that priority date. So don't forget that. Uh, let's see if there's any more gotchas on this. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the next one is your microentity certification. I, I need to reorder these. So the microentity is on page 12. And this is where you're just signing, saying, hey, I'm, uh, I'm a small entity. I meet the application filing and the gross income limits, and then you sign. And again, if there's multiple inventors, they all have to sign this. Because if only one meets microentity and the other one does not, you're not going to get microentity. So all inventors have to sign a microentity sheet. The next one is the information disclosure sheet. That is page 7 and 8. There's two of them. So page 7 is the U.S. and foreign patent references. I just put stars, but what you would do is you would put the U.S. patent number, uh, the pub date, the name of the patentee, and just put all. I mean, you could put down what page or paragraphs there that are relevant, but you could just put all. And down below is the foreign patents. So domestic patents, foreign patents, page 7. Those are your references. Page 10 is other patent, non-patent literature. So anything else you came up with on your search, you use this form, and that's non-patent literature. Then finally, there's the, uh, you need to include an oath or a declaration. That is page 11. Yeah, 11. I recommend a declaration because an oath has to be notarized. So a declaration, you're basically just signing this. And your signature on the USPTO paperwork says you're telling the truth. Right? How did Martha Stewart go to jail? Not because she was convicted of fraud, but because she lied on federal forms. 18 U.S.C. 1001, I think, is the code. So if you want to lie, you federal government. All right? So and you need one of these from each inventor also, right? Uh, you do, yes. Correct. Thank you. Right, so that's that satisfies the federal government. They got plenty of paperwork to process. Um, here's a couple of options. Um, if you want, there's, there's a couple of things you can do to kind of advance the acceleration, if you will, in your, your application. One is you can petition to move to the front of the line. It won't speed the application process up, but it'll put you at the front of the line. It'll cost you, as a micro entity, $35, unless. You're age 65, or you've got bad health, or this contributes to environmental quality, energy conservation, or counterterrorism. Then you can move to the front of the line. Okay. Um, you can only do this on a. When you originally file your utility or your plant designs. You can't do that with a design patent, or what's called a, um, a request for continued examination. I'll talk about that later. So this petition to move to the front of the line. The other thing you want to do is. 
if you want what's called accelerated examination, you want for some reason to have this examine and come to resolution quickly. There's a process called the track one, track one, and the goal is a 12-month uh, final disposition. It won't actually be issued, but they'll get to a disposition within 12 months. It costs a thousand dollars plus a petition fee plus your regular application fee. But for example, I've, um, I've had clients that are in negotiation with um, a large company, so. They want to get through this quickly because an issue patent is certainly a stronger bargaining position than just simply having patent pending. So if you've got that kind of a fish on the hook, it's probably worth a thousand bucks to do an accelerated examination. Now in exchange for that, the pressure's going to be on you. The patent office say, okay, all right, we're going to speed this up, but here's what we need from you. And so what they're going to do is they're going to limit the number of claims, and it's not any more than what you get for the basic price, um, you can get an extra independent. You can't have multiple dependent claims. That means that the, the, the claim that depended on either this claim or that claim, you can't have that. Um, and also, and I need to add a bullet on this, is they're going to shorten your response times. And I'm going to talk about those later. So you get shortened response times now. But in exchange for that, you'll have a resolution within 12 months. That's the goal. So once you've done that, you've filled out the application, you've filled out the federal forms, we, you simply just make PDFs of it. I recommend running them through the copy or something because when you do it straight from an office product, sometimes the fonts don't embed and it doesn't upload right. So I, when I work with clients, they'll come into my office, we'll stick the copier, we'll PDF them, stick them on the stick, plug it in the computer, we log on to the uh, USPTO electronic filing system, upload all of it, and then it'll say okay, um, accept it, it validates, it says okay, do you want to pay now? You say yes. Says, you sure you want to pay now? I said, yeah, I'm sure I want to pay now. And boom, it gives you a receipt. So you put in your credit card, and now you're patent pending, right? So um, that's where you want to be. All right, so that's writing the application, submitting the application. What can happen? What's going to happen after that? Right? Let's say, let, let's fast forward to maybe a couple years down the road. Um, Actually, some things will happen quickly. If you've got missing parts, there's an office that this goes into, and if you're missing signatures, if you're missing um, drawings, they didn't scan right. I've had drawings that didn't scan right for whatever reason. They'll give you a notice and give you a short time to, to correct it. Right? Um, other things you might get are, once they start examining, is maybe a double patenting. So you might have made an, had an invention um, you know, on some device, and then you've got another one that um, is structurally the same. One is it's just the same. They won't allow it. Okay, it's it's what's called statutory dual patenting. It's the same number of elements. It's going to be rejected. You can also have what's called the obvious variant, right? An obviousness double patenting. Not quite the same, but it would be obvious to one who's skilled in the art. But because you're the patentee, the patent application, and you own the original patent, they'll go ahead and they'll allow the prosecution of this as long as you sign a, dis a terminal, it's called the terminal disclaimer, that says that the term of the second patent will end as soon as the term of the first one ends. So it might have just a slight variation to it. The key is, is that that terminal disclaimer on that second patent will exist only as long as you own both patents. The minute you sell or license those patents, they're no longer your, not license, I'm sorry, assigned, um, then the second one will expire. So that's another, that double patenting is something that could come up. The other thing that could co come up would be a restriction requirement. And that would be where the examiner makes a determination and says, you submitted this, but this is really two different inventions. You know, claims one through 10 are this, claims 11 through 20 are something else. Uh, it's gonna take me too much time to do both both, and by the way, they're separate and they're independent, so I'm restricting you. You've got to pick one set. Pick 1 through 11 or, or 1 through 10 or 11 through 20. So you have to pick it. You can traverse and you can petition to argue against, but they're usually pretty good at this. Um, you still have to elect from the choice by the examiner. So you would say, okay, I'm going to elect claims 1 through 10. Then you can pursue claims um, 11 through 20. Yeah, 1 through 20 in what's called a divisional application. Another $400. Just like a separate invention. Um, if you have any doubt, and you think, well, they might, they might look at this as two different inventions, it's better to submit it under one application because if they restrict it, they can't cite one against the other as prior art. 
<laughs> right? Whereas if you submitted two separate applications, you run the risk of them signing one against the other. So let them restrict it, then you file a divisional on the other. So, so in essence then, in the claims, can you submit separate claims for slight variants of the same type of product of what you would be bringing out? Yeah, so that, that's what the multiple claims are for then, essentially? Correct. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, so that, way, do that. so that way it prevents somebody else from coming out with, you know, a similar mouse trap that has like a little difference and, you know, right. and coming up with a new patent for that. Right. So, but okay. what might be run, where it may cross the line though, is if one of those discloses, one of those claims a particular device that, um, let's say it does something and it uses this, it, 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 it um, takes in this piece and it provides this output. And then the other claim might be that it's for that piece that, that's being worked on by that piece. And the key is, are they separate and distinct? Could you could you use this without that? Could you use that without that? If that's the case, they'll restrict it. Okay. But certainly, like we talked about the golf club, you want to come at that at different angles, different embodiments, different scope in terms of breadth and narrowness. You want to use those 20 claims to claim this as many ways as you can because the feedback you're going to get back when certain things are rejected based on prior art is going to tell you, oh, okay, but there's still this, this got through, this one didn't, but because of this, but if I add these other elements, I can get around that. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you only submit one or two claims and they get rejected, you don't get a lot of good feedback. Whereas if you, I don't want to say throw the kitchen sink, because if it's too deep focused, you're not going to get good feedback. But if yeah. you focus your claims, claim it in a number of different ways, you'll get very, very good feedback. Interesting. Uh, so I talked about that. Uh, if you like the claims 1 through 10, so you use a uh, divisional application. I'll talk about that later to claims uh, to claim 11 through 20. Um, you could save harbor. You can't be... Um, have one patent side, application side against the other. Um, and I've had both. You're supposed to be able to do this over the phone. Sometimes they want it right. So that's a restriction plan. The other thing you might get are objections. Those are minor things. Those would be format of your claim or maybe your drawings are informal, those kinds of things. So you can get objections. Okay. Um, you could also get an objection because the dependent claim, um, which might be allowable, is based on a uh, refers back to a, a rejected independent claim or other dependent claim. So that would be an objection. All you have to do is rewrite it in independent form and it would be allowed. The other rejections are right by the rules, right? All the requirements we talked about before, you had to have, it had to be patent eligible, have uh, written description described, written description and enablement, and uh, particularly point out. So you can get rejections for all of these. And in these cases, uh, these are pretty straightforward. We talked about that, and uh, if they were to particularly point out would be um, indefiniteness, right? So the software examples would be if you're trying to claim the result and not the structure, that would be indefinite. I talked about antecedent basis, right? Introduced in the definite, thereafter uh, referred to in the, in the definite. Did I get that right, English major? Yeah. Yes. Indefinite. Indefinite, indefinite, right. So uh, you can get rejections there. Uh, the rejections for novelty or obviousness, these are going to be based on prior art that the examiner finds. Okay. So what does he do? What does he or she do as an examiner? Well, first, what they need to do when they look at prior art is first they look at your, your um, at the prior art from their, from their searches, and they determine the scope and content of the prior art and then they look at the differences between the prior art and what your application is articulating. Then they have to say, okay, what's the difference? What would be the difference to somebody who's ordinarily skilled in the art? And that's, and that's basically the process that they go through when they're comparing yours against prior art. Um, there's what are called secondary considerations, but I tell you these are very weak. Right? So when you try to say, well, you know, this has been trying, it's been they try to solve this for a long time, but nobody's really come up with the answer. There's some weight to these, but it's way down. Basically, you're, you're back to disclosing and trying to claim the difference between what you've got and what the prior art has. All right. So, what would be examples of where they might reject you on obviousness is if you're using known methods 
to get predictable results. One of ordinary skill in the art would say, well, look, here's the prior art. This is already known. That's already known. You're simply just using these. That's obvious. Substituting, right? Using known techniques, applying a known technique to a known device, yielding predictable results. All of that, if, if, they, if, your, con if your invention doesn't distinguish over the prior art, then you're going to get an, an obviousness rejection. Now, there's different reasons um, within that. These are tests that are applied. One would be an obvious to try. So in other words, prior art A is this, prior art B is this. One who's normally skilled in the art would know that it would be obvious to try these things. The key to an obvious to try rejection is if there's you know four, five, six ways of, of combining these, then you're closer to it could be an obvious to try argument. If there were a hundred different ways of doing this together, then that's a weaker argument for them to make, right? Because there's just how would the inventor know to, to do two or three hundred different ways? It's much more obvious if there's only three ways that they go together. Okay? Um, there's also they look at if there's some design incentives in the market forces and or market forces. Usually they're looking at how the prior art teaches. So does the prior art teach, suggest, or motivate somebody to do this very thing? And if the answer is, yeah, it does, then you're liable to get an obviousness rejection. So they go through that process. Then do, they can't just say, OK, X, X, red mark pen, and throw it back at you. They have to articulate to you all right, the following. First, a finding that the prior art included each element claimed and this is for obviousness, not for novelty. Although not necessarily in a single reference, right? They can use multiple references. Um, and the only, um, the only thing that's missing is the combination, the fact that they were combined. Then they have to find that one who's ordinarily skilled in the art would have known enough to do this, and in fact, may have been motivated to do this. Okay? Um, and maybe that it was predictable. And then they can also look at um, what are called the Graham uh, factual inquiries, and that's these are the specific questions they ask. But that's what they've got to go through. So they've got to do the same process, do their reference searches, come up with those, and tell you why. So for example, let's go to this, um, let's see if this one's a good example. Yeah, okay. So page 40. We're going to come back and look at this problem. Page 40 is part of the examiner's rejection back to IBM. And so if you look at claim number 8 towards the bottom, it says claims 1 through 15 are rejected under the first inventor file provisions um, as being unpatentable over the combination of Tanucci here in, uh, in view of Bomajar, Bomaraju, um, and in view, further view of Parks. And then he goes on to explain why those grant his application is reading on those three applications. And then he probably says later on down there, it would be obvious for one who's skilled in the art to do this. If we look closely enough and read through this, that statement is in, there it is, page 43, about the third, what is that, one, two, three, four, fifth line down. It would have been obvious to one ordinary skill in the art before the effective line like that, 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 so they have to articulate that back to you. They can just simply, like I said, mark you with a red pen and throw it back at you. Okay. All right. They're free to use analogous art. Sometimes you might get a rejection. You say, well, how did they use this prior art? Because that guy's device is used for making tractor implements. And, you know, I'm doing something that disables a vehicle, you know, that's fleeing down a freeway. They're free to use analogous art um, as long as it's reasonably pertinent to the problem. Okay. So let's look at this. Let's do, let's look at this. So we looked at the application, and the application went all the way up to 35, right? So starting on page 37 is the first office action. And that goes from 37 to 
51. Okay, so page 37, what you need to pay attention to, this is the cover sheet. This will arrive on your first office action. In this column on the right-hand side, up the page, kind of on the left at the bottom, it says notification date. In this case, it's February 10th, 2016. You need to pay attention to that date. Because every, your responses, their due dates are all triggered by that date, so do not forget that date. You, you let that date go and you go abandon. Abandoned means exactly what it sounds like. Your application is abandoned. Now, this is the patent office, and you can you know, resurrect it for a nice chunk of change. You want to avoid that. Okay, so that's the cover page. Page 38 is a little bit more detailed. So, box one is checked because they, in this case, IBM pursued track one. Box 2B, this action is non final. See that? Five, claims one through 15 are pending. Seven, claims one through 15 are rejected. Holy cow, if IBM with their army of, their, of attorneys can't get through 15 claims, how are you gonna do it, right? It's not that bad. Line 11, the drawings are accepted. And then there's a couple of other administrative check boxes. Starting on page 39, is the detailed action. That's where he articulates back to the applicant what's wrong specifically with it. Whether it be a patentability issue, written description, enablement, novelty, obviousness, whatever it is, it's all articulated in these pages. Okay. So, it starts on page, uh, what, 39, and he keeps going and refers to Tanucci, and he's rejecting it for all these various reasons. Keep going, 42, 43, up to 45. Um, he's rejecting every claim, right? Looks like a bloodbath, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. okay. And finally, you get over to page 13. He's got a conclusion. You know, any inquiry concerning this communication, Here's my name and number, and if you can't reach me, here's my supervisor, and then some generic info on page 51, love and kisses, Francisco Ocampo. Okay, so it sounds pretty bad. So at this point, clients come back to me and they say, you know, they're on the floor and they're depressed, and you know, they put all this energy in, I pick them up, dust them off, and say, it's not that bad. Hang on, let's, let's figure out what's going on here. So what do we do? First step is what we want to do is try to understand why did the examiner reject what he did. Okay. Keep in mind that these examiners. Um, it's going to be one. So these examiners have an inbox that looked like this, and they've only got so much time to examine each application. So think about what they're doing. They're doing their searches. They're finding prior art. They're doing from, they read yours. They look at this. Eh, it looks like the same thing. Reject, reject, reject. Send it back to you. Right? It's not quite that flippant. These are very professional people. But if you think about it, they're seeing this for the first time. You probably poured, if not months, years into this. So you think it's obvious. Right? You think, God, anybody knows this. Well, but this is a good first third-party test that says, wait a minute. You're not that different on the surface from what you've written. Usually it's a failure for you to articulate and describe and adequately claim what you're inventing. Okay? So what do we do is we sit down and we try to find out from the prior art that the examiner um, referenced and what he referenced the differences as. We go back and figure out, okay, did he really understand this? What were the differences that he missed? Then, at this point, once you've got an office action, you can call the examiner. You have a form you can fill out and schedule a, an appointment, but quite frankly, they take your calls. And if you're a pro se applicant, I gotta tell you, they really are open to helping pro se applicants. If an agent or attorney calls them, it's usually kind of a headbutting uh, tournament, but with pro se applicants, they're very helpful. They're not gonna give you the answer, they're not gonna tell you how to write the claim, they're not gonna tell you how to write the description, but they're gonna say, look, this is the piece that is, it reads on this art, this reads on that art, and what the goal is here, understand what wasn't, didn't quite get through in your application. Because then you can amend your application, hopefully to get 
around his rejections. So that phone call, I avoid. I ask people to uh, take advantage of that. Okay. So let's take the most com common rejections, and that would be obviousness. Okay, where they've got at least two other patents that they've used to cite against you. Right. So what you need to do is. Um, you want to, in our amendment, you know to argue that one who's ordinary skilled in art couldn't have combined these because there were technological differences. So he might say, well, it would be obvious, you know, if this patent does this, this patent does that, it would be obvious for one who's skilled in art to do that. You might come back in our amendment, our strategy might be to say, well, it's not obvious because in addition to just, you know, using this mechanical approach with this mechanical approach, you know, one would have to know how to do these three extra steps. That's not obvious. So that would be an example of how you would re, you know, counter obviousness rejections. You can also say the elements of combination don't merely perform the function that each performs separately, right? There's something more. There's some synergy there. Uh, unexpected results, maybe the prior art teaches away. Maybe the prior art taught them to use some kind of a chemical bath in order to um, you know, gain a, a, a cleaner substrate. And maybe you come up with a mechanical approach to clean the substrate. So the prior art says, you know, mechanical approach doesn't doesn't work because it leaves behind residue and there's, you know, there's additional particulate matter, et cetera, whatever it is. Um, but you found a way to get around that because you got an extra step. Um, you might claim that the prior is not analogous, but like I said, that's probably pretty tough. So anyway, you come up, you talk with the examiner, and uh, find out what's what he did or didn't understand, he or she. We come up with our response, and now this is the format for the response. That starts on page 53. So this is IBM's response. And in this particular case, of course, it's a software patent, so um, you have to kind of make an analogy to what you're doing. But it starts with the cover page, and these are this is what you have. You have a cover sheet um, which has all the information on it and a table of contents. So then you attach your amendments to the spec, your amendments to the claims, your amendments to the drawings, your mark sheet and your drawings. So that's the format of an amendment. That's your answer to his first office section. All right? Uh, let's move straight forward. If you're going to amend the specification, right, any of those paragraphs that were in that application, you can tell them to replace a paragraph, um, in which case um, all subject matter has to be underlined, right? So you put all your new matter is underlined. Exit, uh, matter that you're taking out is crossed out. Right? If there's fewer than six characters, you can use double brackets to delete. You can add a new paragraph. So if you want to add a paragraph between 71 and 72, you'd say, please add paragraph 71.1. You can add that. Uh, deleting, you can just say delete paragraph 19. Um, generally, you're not going to amend your abstract. Speed up here. Claims. Claims, though, so an abstract, I mean, the, the specification, you're just correcting certain paragraphs. Claims, you have to have a complete claim listing, even the ones that you're, maybe that 11 through 20 that we withdrew, you have to include those in here. And there's a specifier in there. So, example, if you look at their claims starting on page 54, the first one is currently amended. And you can see they underlined the matter they've added. And let's see, and they've crossed off matching tokens. Right? Where do you see that? They crossed out magic matching tokens and they added underlying material. So you're either going to have original, currently amended, new, canceled, withdrawn if it was restricted. That claims 11 through 20 that we chose not to prosecute. Uh, these others you won't use, typically. So you have to have big claim listing. Um, then, what you have to do is, uh, if you have drawings, is you submit replacement sheets, okay? Or if you're adding new drawings, you have a new sheet. You put that up in the margin. Replacement sheet, new sheet. They didn't do that in this attack. It's hard to find one example that has everything in there. And rather than come with 18 <coughs> pack examples, it's easier just to explain this. Um, if you update your drawings, Right, which have elements in them, keep in mind you may have to go back to amend your uh, detailed description because that's where you're describing everything you've drawn. So make sure that you might have to make a place. So the rule is no new matter. 
you can't add new new matter to the application. Now, there's a couple cases that aren't considered new matter. So if one who's ordinarily skilled in the art would recognize that you made an error and you're correcting it, that's not new matter. If you're just rephrasing or using known definitions, that's not new matter. If you strongly correlated your structure and function in your application and you're simply elaborating on that, right, and there's no change in terms of that correlation, that's not new matter. And what you have to do is you have to show, like for instance, you're correcting that spec and you're saying, you're changing that term, you're going to say, you know, as shown in paragraph one or drawing figure three, item 12. So you have to, don't just put it in there, put where it was in the original application and make a statement, no new matter. Okay. Um, and it can't be like, you know, the possibility that's new matter or probability. They're going to hold you to that. There's a lot of new matter rejections in, uh, in amendments. Okay. Remember I told you that trigger date, what was it, February 10th of 16? Um, statutorily, by statute, 35 U.S.C., you get six months on most items, okay? There's some things that you get 30 days. 30 days means 30 days. So if you get a rejection or an office action dated March 1st, okay, you don't get till April 1st if you have 30 days. You get March 31st. Everything else you get to the day, even if it's two months. So two months from February 1st is not 60 days from February 1st, it's March, April 1st. Um, you get the next business day if it's Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday. Now, first three months are free. Here's the trick. Three months are free. If you need the fourth month, the fifth month, or the sixth month, there's a charge. The patent office is a four-fee agency, so all the fees that go into the patent office go to run the agency. Unfortunately, Congress has appropriated some of that money to run other agencies too, but um, it is a four fee agency. So but you can respond to these three months at a time. Are these dates to have it physically received by the office or postmarked dates? Uh, these have to be postmarked. Correct. First class, and I would advise using a return receipt postcard. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an amendment that it contains drawings, uh, specification, you put that in a little self address stamped envelope, they'll check it off, mail it back to you, and you've got proof. Mm -hmm. So you can submit the form? So um, if you file in paper the original application, it actually costs you $200 more. So you want to file online. And you can file in one of two ways as a registered filer or an unregistered filer. Anybody can go on. Log on is to click the unregistered filer, submit your application, you don't pay the $200, you just pay the $400. After that, if you're an unregistered filer, everything else is in paper. You can, if you want, sign up as a registered user and you can submit it in electronically. It doesn't cost anything, but you have to correspond back and forth, make sure you've got an up-to-date computer because there's browser issues, those kinds of things. Because they give you a key. Um, Information disclosure sheets. You, you if you find uh, new matter along the way while your patent is being prosecuted, you should be turning that over to the patent office if it's pertinent to the examination or application. And depending on when you turn it over, there might or might not be fees. Um, I talked about if you let it go abandoned. If you want to revive it after it's gone abandoned, it's eight hundred fifty dollars. Okay, so it's expensive and it creates a point of vulnerability. Again, if later on you're successful and somebody's looking for a way to invalidate your patent because you're making a statement on there that this delay was unavoidable between the time it went abandoned and now that I'm giving this check for eight hundred to revive. And all somebody has to the question is, well, prove that it was unavoidable. And if you can't, it's a point of vulnerability. Okay? If your invention never goes anywhere, nobody will care. But the minute this thing's worth anything, Infringers and challenges will come out of the woodwork. Okay, so you submit your application. If you responded in time, you're only into this thing for 400 bucks. If it issues, $240, and you have a patent, an issued patent at the micro entity level. Okay, at this point, if you want to make assignments, for example, maybe you created an LLC and you want to sign your patent to your LLC, I would make them now at the end. Because if you prosecute a patent under a company name, then you have to pay a professional to do it. So prosecute it pro se and make your assignment at the end. Uh,
maintenance fees. There are maintenance fees. So these are after issue, not from filing, so after issue. So three and a half, seven and a half, and eleven and a half years, four hundred nine hundred eighteen fifty for micro entity. But if you think about this, three and a half years after issue is probably five to six years after you apply. Right? So you've got a pretty good idea, is this going anywhere or not? So you can make some choices as to whether just to let it go abandoned voluntarily because it's just not going anywhere or to continue to pay the maintenance fees. And if it is going somewhere, these are probably pretty insignificant. So what is the difference between the three numbers you have there, the 1600, 800? Well, that's the same thing, right? So this is full fare, small, small entity, micro entity. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll amend that chart, sorry. And design and plan patents have no maintenance fees. Okay, so we're at 1 o'clock, which I think is just after 9. Everything that um, they allowed me, um, like I said, it's generally a three-hour class. Um, I'm happy to go on for another 20 to cover some stuff, or do you guys have questions? Or I don't even know if they have somebody else coming in here. I'd like to hear you keep going. going. Okay, well, feel free to walk out. Just don't throw, <laughs> don't throw anything at me. Um, Do I have to vacate here? Are we? Okay. Oh, there, there you are. Yeah, because like, as long as everybody wants to keep going, please feel free to come eat. I know we're going through lunch hours, so. Yeah, it's informal. We'll keep going. You're not insulting <laughs> me if you get up for pizza. Um, Some people fall asleep. This isn't for everybody. <laughs> okay, we'll take a quick one minute break. How are you doing? Yeah?
have a lot of place for us. I was going to go over this. Do you know like the bathroom where they put up the walls? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, I put like my, uh, like, mid master in and if that one, that could actually just go out of the program and fail it. Um, yeah. The grade was a lot of master plans. Yeah, just a little. And when I got into the room, somebody had left the wall. And I thought that was a new Okay, ready? Okay, okay. Yeah. Alrighty. So let's get back to the lecture. First of all, lecture. Where lecture? Not lecture. That's what it's called. The workshop. So, yeah. Well, my office is very excited. So, if you find her, you'll find her. Okay, so just to kind of recap, to reinforce the, um, I would say the, the interchange here that's going on between an applicant and a patent office. In the application, we saw 15 claims, right? And then in the office action, we saw they rejected all 15 claims. We go back to the issue patent on the back page. You'll see they got 12 claims issued. Right. So it's that interaction between you and the patent office, and making sure that you put together a good application that adequately distinguishes from the prior art is what's going to get you um, to take you to the successful place. That you're going to have. Okay. So let's cover some other things. I guess we've lost the. Uh, those that are less dedicated, we're down to the core group here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, didn't scare everybody off. All right. Um, well, I, I have one quick question. Yes. So for the response to uh, when they you know, said that they were uh, rejecting all of the claims, do you have m multiple opportunities to respond like that? Like, if they reject it again, can you respond again? Right. And I'm going to go into some of this now. Okay. You're right. So the basic application fee mm -hmm. is you submit your application, you get a first office action, Okay. You amend, yeah. and then you get a final office action. Okay. After the final, there's only limited ways that you can amend. Okay. Okay, and I'll talk about that. Great. Right. All right, Question. so, yes. Uh, can you reply to the amendments individually, or do you have to do uh, all of them together? But for the claims that have been rejected, do you have to do one in the middle of everything corrected, or do you can just go each and, like, send them, like, once you completed one of the claims, send it again. So what you want to do is, what the office is obligated to do is find, read your application and evaluate it, examine it, and they're obligated to come back to you with every possible rejection, point of rejection on there. They can't just find a couple of rejections and throw it at you, and that way when you amend and you fix those, then they find a few more. That's not the way the process works. They got to particularly back to every possible rejection that they can see. Then what you've got to do in your amendment, you've got to reply to each and every rejection. That may entail any or at least one. You're amending something, either the spec or the claims or the drawing or all of it, or two out of three or something. But you've got to answer each one of those claims. So if you go back to that example, you know, go through and read through it, and next time I give this based on the feedback, I get different examples, but um, you'll see where the first rejection he outlines and says, okay, you know, one or two rejection novelty against Tanucci. You describe this, Tanucci describes that, therefore, you know, it's, it's non-distinguishable. So you have to go back and answer that. Then his next rejection, whatever that is, you have to answer that. So you have to go down the line, all of it in the same amendment goes in. You have to be fully responsive to this rejection. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. okay. One more question. Is it possible to change patent types? Like, if you apply for a device patent and there isn't any way around it, can you then convert it to a utility patent? Uh, there's time limitations. So to, to take a priority, if you file a divisional or a, a design patent to take priority from a utility, you've only mm -hmm. got six months, I believe. To look at it again, six months. Okay. Um, you can file new patents, you can keep filing okay. applications. Okay. All right, so, and you, and you, um, no, because in the beginning you designate what that patent is. Mm -hmm. All right, remember we talked about a restriction requirement where the examiner looks at it and says, you know, you've got two examples, you've got two inventions here, they're built independently and distinct from the other. You elected claims one through 10, now you want to go back and file claims 11 through 20. You do that with what's called a divisional application. 
You can file that at any time during the pendency of the parent application, right, the first application. The parent continues to exist. You continue to prosecute claims 1 through 10. The second application, you will now prosecute claims 11 through 20. Um, we talked about the safe harbor. Um, you retain the original priority date from the original parent filing. Uh, filing. Um, and your patent term also extends from your original. So if you wait two years from the first minute, the parent has to be co-pending. If you wait a couple of years and file your divisional, it's, that divisional is going to get 20 years from the original priority, not 20 starting from when you file the original. Filing fee is 400, so it's just like another application, which makes sense. Can you all see over there? Continuing application. This would be used, for example, if you've been prosecuting your application, and out of those, uh, let's say, 15 claims, it looks like he's going to allow two of them. But you know, there's, there's another half dozen more that you think you can still get. What you might do is file a continuation for those other ones that are still being rejected, and allow those two to issue under the parent. Same rule, you have to apply, you have to apply for continuation during the pendency of the parent. No new matter. It uses the same specification and drawings. It's examined separately, so it goes to the back of the line, okay? Um, and it's four hundred dollars. And the term is calculated again from the parent, just like the division. Right? The term is right twenty years of protection from the date of priority to when this basically goes public. So four hundred dollars, just like a regular application. Now, if you do have new matter, that's when you use what's called a continuation in part. So maybe you've got a product, you've made it, you've patented, you've got your patent pending, and you come up with some new, some new matter, something that you want to improve upon this with. You could file a continuation in part during the pendency of the parent. Um, it's four hundred dollars, so it's just like filing a new application. Now you can add new matter. The priority date, right? The patent term only starts from the filing date of your continuation in part for that for that matter that was added new. That starts with the new priority date. Yeah. Let's say, for instance, you're prosecuting your application and you're almost there. You know, out of the 15 claims, it looks like you're going to get seven or eight claims, and uh, but they're all rejected right now. But basically, you're, you're almost there. Okay, you can one more examination. You think you can fix it? You might consider filing what's called a request for continued examination. It's $100 cheaper. Okay, at least the first time around, and you could use that to get another bite at the apple on that same application. And you can file multiples, and the second one will be even more money. Okay. Now, there is a pilot program. Uh, this is still going on through September of this year, so there's still another, what, six months. Um, it's called an After Final Consideration Pilot 2.0. So let's say you've gotten your, your first office action, you amend it, you get the final office action. Right, you got six months before this thing goes abandoned. So you got to decide: Am I going to? You can appeal. You can uh, file a continuation, continuation bar. Maybe one of the things you might do is, under this pilot, for free, you can submit an app, uh, another amendment, an after final amendment. But it has to be the examiner has to be able to examine this, and I think they've got like a three-hour limitation. So unless you're very close. This may not work, but it could work. Okay, so it doesn't extend, by the way, the statutory response time. So when you've got that final office action, you've got six months. This takes about 45 days. So what you don't want to do is don't wait for four months and then turn this in because you've only got probably another six, uh, you know, what, 30 days or so by the time you get the answer to this before it's going to go abandoned. So try to do this early. But you could possibly get a notice of allowance. Um, and this is good, like I said, through September. So it's a pilot program. They're trying to be more friendly to applicants. Appeals, you can appeal some of the decisions. The Patent Trial and Appeal Board uh, reviews uh, examiner decisions. So if you think the examiner has done something uh, that's not according to the rules, you can appeal to the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Um, the, the Circuit of Appeals for the Federal Circuit would then, if you want to apply for a court case, would appeal PTAB decisions. There's others that are, that are so-called non-appealable decisions. You basically petition the Commissioner of Patents. Never had any clients had to go through any of this. 
folks at the patent office are very good, do their job well. Um, but you know, in some cases, there are there are cases where there's some issues. There are some ways. I'll just go through this really quick of either challenging or asserting your patent rights. So once you've got a patent issued, okay. Actually, some of these are pre-submission. Um, there are ways for somebody to challenge your patent. So we'll go through some of this. A reissue patent would be used if you have a deficiency. Let's say you notice a deficiency in your patent. Um, and maybe you're, you want to go out and enforce it, or you want to go license it to somebody, but you know it's got this problem. And maybe that problem might be you didn't claim a priority right or something, okay? So you need to fix that. A reissue is the way you would do that. It costs $760 to first submit it, and then it's going to cost another $240 once they reissue. What you're doing is you're surrendering your original patent, and you're saying, look, it's defective. But I want to correct this and fill out the paperwork, and here's the issue, here's how it gets corrected. If that gets happened, it fixes your problem, and then you can go on with whatever your issue is you were trying to do. So you can't capture what matter was given up during prosecution. So if you started off with some broad claims and you got those, or maybe you had to narrow them during prosecution, right? You can't go back and try to rebroaden. You can't do that. Can't add new matter. Um, oh, you can't. That's right. You can't broaden within two years. I'm sorry, but after two years after issue, you can't broaden. And you, it doesn't start with a new 20 years. It's still only good through the term of the original parent application. Ex parte examination is a case where somebody might challenge your patent. Um, it can be issued, actually initiated by you or a third party, but usually it's a third party. Um, once it's initiated, then it's between you and the PTO to resolve. Um, it can be uh, used to challenge a, a patent based on patents or printed publications. Uh, the legal standard is uh, that the requester has to establish that there's a substantial new question of patentability. Now those are more, those are uh, $6,000 for somebody else. If you want to do it on your own patent, it'd be $3,000. So a third party doesn't get the benefit of micro-entity pricing for an ex parte examination. Post-grant review, uh, this is within nine months after a patent issues, if somebody wants to challenge a patent based on patents, printed publications, public use, on sale activity. You know, this is part of the stuff I cut off at the beginning because I didn't narrow this down. But one of the things you want to be very careful of is public disclosures, okay? If you disclose some, uh, your novelty publicly, technically you've got 12 months before it's a bar to patent. So be very careful of making a first sale because that starts the clock. Now you can disclose things technically, usually people use non-disclosures, working with other people to develop the technology, that's fine if it's using to develop your technology. But once you make an offer for sale, that starts the clock. So be very careful of that. So uh, if you've got problems with written description, enablement, patent eligibility, those can be resolved with this. $12,000 to file it, $18,000 once that process is complete. Now that sounds like a lot of money. But typically, these kinds of processes were carried out in district court, okay, which can run a heck of a lot more. Yeah. So these processes were put in place by the patent office to try to save money and, and, keep, and keep the courts clear from a lot of these issues that could be resolved by the experts, which are the patent office, which is the patent office. All right, uh, inter-parties review. Inter-parties review is initiated by a third party, um, basically almost the same as a uh, as the uh, post-grant review, a uh, post-grant review is during nine months after it's issued. Inter-parties is after the nine months of issue. This is only based on patents and printed publications, right? So none of the third-party sales or anything like that. Um, the uh, legal standard is a reasonable likelihood that they will at least prevail on one claim. Um, and filing fee is 9000 and 14000 once the process is complete. <coughs> a supplemental examination would be a way to what they call cleanse a patent. Okay? So for example, um, 
let's say you didn't disclose something to the patent office. Earlier we talked about disclosing you know, information to the patent office. Let's say you didn't do that. You didn't file yet. The chance to file some information is, let's say you filed a, a, an international patent, PCT, and you filed a domestic patent in the U.S. And then as a result of the international process, you got back some prior art notices. You immediately have to give that to the patent office. Even though they should have it, it's the same office. You've got to do it. It's, it's incumbent upon you. Let's say you don't do that. Later on, you don't want to be um, accused of inequitable conduct. You might use a supplemental examination to you know, cleanse the patent. This is one process. So it's a lot cheaper. Uh, it's about 1100 to file it. And then if they go to re-examine it, then it's another 3000 But again, this is one of those cases where if the patent is going to be worth something, that could be an insignificant cost. Uh, Pre-issuance pre submission will be something that, while there's a patent still pending, let's say, for instance, you still have a patent still pending in the office, and I'm a competitor, and I find something out, uh, some other information that you didn't disclose, or uh, some other prior art that would be relevant to examining your, your application. I can turn that into the patent office as, as a submittal that I think they should look at before they issue you a patent. And as long as I meet some time requirements here, then they'll accept it. And there's really no cost involved, I mean, unless you're a large company, there's really no cost. So that's just a way that the patent office can use the public. I don't know how much of this is really done. I don't know if they have statistics on this or not. But if you're in a really hot space, as soon as you file and you publish, people will pick it up. So it could be that, that some of that's being used. Covered business method is, is going away. I'm not going to worry about that. A derivation proceeding. These used to be what are called interference proceedings. So let's say, for instance, um, you know, I enter into a research project with you and we, um, you come up with something. We're in conversation and through that we know what you're coming up with. And then I run around and I quickly go and file. Okay? So I would have derived my invention from my interaction. Okay? So there's a way for you to pursue that and through the patent office, through a derivation proceeding. It's going to take attorneys. It's going to take a lot of discovery. It's a very expensive road that's fraught with a lot of uncertainty. Okay? That's why I always recommend people just don't be disclosing any more than you absolutely have to. And of course, you always have to disclose at some time. So you have to know who you can trust. And that's your gut. Right? So keep things secret. Get on file. If you do have to file a provisional, that can be done too. But make sure you're protected because some of these other proceedings can be very expensive and may not go the way you think they're going to go. Okay, I did include an example of the design package. So I think it's that last package in there. <coughs> and it's that, um, it's like a digital multimeter. And this particular design pattern has two embodiments. And the front page is the one that has the text on the left side and the <coughs> figure one on the right side. As you can see, that's the entire specification on the left. That's cool, right? Hardly anything. This is easy. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, it's just protecting the ornamental design of this. But all they've done is brief description of the drawings. They've listed the drawings. And at the bottom, I claim the ornamental design for a digital multimeter as shown and described. Period. That's it. That's the, that's the application along with the drawings. Okay? So, let me ask somebody, tell me the difference between figure one and figure eight. So the first seven figures belong together, and then eight through 14 belong together. So the knob is different. How is it different? It's uh, smaller. It doesn't have all the multiple uh, circles around the outside of the knob. Okay. It's a different embodiment. A 
mind, in the display screen. Yes. So what a, what a design pattern, the way you use a design pattern is what's in solid lines is what you're protecting. What's in dotted lines shows environmental. So in one embodiment, what they're showing in figure one is they're protecting the outline of this multimeter and the knob. Right? The knob where it's positioned and the outline is all solid. The rest of it's dotted. So it's not really claiming the display, <laughs> the two buttons, or the three connectors at the bottom. Hey, figure eight, if, you, if they're claiming the display, not the knob or the connection points or the buttons. So two different buttons. So that's one potential way of how you could use that. You know, how much protection is afforded this? You know, it's, it's a test of kind of the normal person. So if you came up with a digital multimeter that was, you know, a little bit different, you know, there's, it's kind of what was a normal person, would they be confused? Okay. And you could Google, you know, design infringement and, and look at some cases and see what kind of how different cases have fared. Okay. So that's a, an example of a design pattern. Very simple to put together, a lot cheaper, uh, only only protects the decorative aspect. Um, and then of course you probably have seven figures, right? So you have a front, the back, a left, the right, a top, a bottom, a cube, six sides plus an isometric. <coughs> typically seven figures. What is claimed is normal design for a blank as shown and described here in the period. That's it. Okay, international. Let's talk a little bit about international coverage. So the United States has its patent office, as does some um, hundreds of companies across the world. They have their own patent um, laws and procedures. There are, however, some treaties that make things easier for one to file in regions so that you're not having to file across several different countries, at least in the beginning. Okay? The most widely used one is called the Patent Cooperation Treaty. That's a treaty of now, I think there's 151 countries that are members of the PCT. And what you can get is protection for up to 30 months. It's kind of like filing a provisional. So if you file a PCT, then you get, from, you get 30 months from your priority date to file in each of the individual countries. So if you think your markets are going to be Japan and Germany and France and England and whatever, you can file a PCT and within 30 months of your priority date, you then file a Japanese application, a German application, or an EPO, which would be the European Union. You can file that as well as certain uh, coverage in Europe. Right? So it's, it's very advantageous. Um, you, what the process is you choose your international search authority. Typically, if you're here in the U.S., you choose the U.S., but you might also choose the European or the Korean office. There's a Russian office and there's other offices as well. So you file once in your native language, English, and you get this, this period. Then you can file applications later on in the national offices. There are a few countries that are not members of the Patent Cooperation Treaty. There you have to file within 20 months. And again, of your priority date, not of the filing date of the PCT. So you enter this in what's called Chapter 1, and you file it with your receiving office. So you fill out it, and you can usually take the, your domestic application. So what I do with clients is, maybe we file a U.S. patent. We can take that and just reformat it slightly, use the... Uh, PCT forms and then submit that as a PCT application. Okay, you pick your uh, uh, your search authority. At month 16, the International Search Authority establishes two things: a written search report, international search report, and a written opinion. They publish this. Okay, but the written opinion doesn't get published yet. You get the option to amend these claims and provide a brief statement if you want. So almost like it's going to be examined, but it's really not going to be examined. Okay. So they issue these two, and then at month 18, they, the uh, WIPO office, the International Bureau, publishes your application, including if you sent in any amendments, they'll include that if you got them in on time. And they publish the International Search Report, not the written opinion. Then at month 28, the International Bureau publishes the written opinion, and then before month 30, you have to then file in those countries. Okay. So that's the process for what's called Chapter 1. The International Search Report, basically, they'll find 
related art. They'll say, here are these other references, and then they've got a letter code that says, you know, very relevant, not so relevant. Um, they've got some codes. The written opinion, on the other hand, is actually an opinion about patentability. So they don't publish that. So what the world then sees at month 18, if you follow one of these, the world sees at least what the International Search Authority would, would come up with on a search against you. That's all they see. But by month 28, they see their opinion. All right. Now, there is an option here. Um, by month 19, excuse me. Now, in month 19, you have an option to actually have a supplementary search if you'd like. So maybe you requested the U.S. as a search authority. Maybe you want to have a second search by the Korean office or the Russian office or another office. You can do that by month 19. Uh, just gets you a more comprehensibility, uh, comprehensible school, uh, search. Um, it might give you better information for a national application. Um, it might even reduce the need for further searches by that office. Not clear. And that's usually available just before the 30 month deadline. So that's an option. Um, also, by, by month 22, you can elect what's called Chapter 2. That looks very much like they're examining the application. Okay? What happens is you can submit amendments to the description claims of the drawings, you can actually interview. And you can dialogue with the IPA examiner. Okay. So again, nothing issues out of a PCT, but this might get you further down the road towards, um, let's say, a highly probable application in terms of your success in one of the national filings. And that's extra also. So what are the pricing? Um, first off, those are both non-binding, right? They don't get end, end up in any kind of a patent. It's like a provisional. So the basic filing fee, if you're going to use the U.S. as the receiving office for a micro entity, is seventeen hundred dollars. So that's a pretty cheap price to pay to get at least initial coverage at around 151 countries across the globe. Okay. So normally, without the PCT. You'd have to file right away in Germany and France and England and Japan, and you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, potentially, depending on how many countries you're filing. So that's a pretty cheap fee. If you wanted that supplementary search fee, it's another 500. Chapter 2 fee is not much more than 356. Again, these are U.S. prices. Depending on what choices you made, there's other options, but this gives you a basic idea. It at least gives you get an initial um, international coverage is not that expensive. There is a European patent convention, so you, that's another treaty. Um, you do have to be represented by a local attorney there. I had to recheck this, but a while back there was a four-year backlog to being examined. Okay. Um, but that's kind of good. Maybe being pending is not that bad. Um, and that also can serve as a basis for a national patent application in individual countries. There are other regional um, treaties, Eurasian Patent, ARIPO, and OAIPI, but these get in increasingly kind of um, smaller markets, if you will. So you, but again, if that's your market, if your market is the French-speaking countries of Africa, then you know you might look at this treaty. Okay. Then the last line I usually show people is foreign filing requirements. So if you're a U.S. citizen. You want to file in the U.S. first, all right? If you don't do that, you get in lots of trouble, okay? Lots of trouble. Fines, possible prison sentences, depending on how bad this, you know, the technology is, how advanced technology is. Now, the good news is your application, your U.S. patent application is considered a request for foreign filing. Usually, you'll get back immediate feedback, foreign filing license granted, comes back on the receipt, okay? If you want to make sure that you get it, you can specifically ask for a foreign filing license. They've got six months to reply. If they don't reply within six months, you're free, you're free to go ahead and file for it. Okay. Uh, I think that is it for that. That just says that 
if you use a patent agent in India to do your searches, um, that's not considered for a filing requirement because you're simply using them as a service provider, right, for your U.S. file. Or if you're in a multinational company and you're a U.S. citizen and you're filing, they're filing in Germany, again, the company, because the company is international, you don't get caught in it. Um, so there's the prison time, $10,000 fines or both. And then, of course, there's, if you're working in any technologically sensitive area, there's a lot of three, three and four letter government agencies that, like ITAR, they want to keep track of what we're doing with sensitive technology, so you want to be worried of that. What about if you're a dual citizen for some of those things? <laughs> you know, I've never been asked that question, but I suppose if you're a citizen of Germany and you file in Germany, it seems to me that you'd be okay, but I, I have to look that up. Never been asked that. Let's see, if I went back to the beginning, um, let's see if there's anything else of relevance here. <clears throat> um, usually I cover even why you had to begin with, I open up with that. So, you know, the idea of a patent is being able to exclude others from making, using, or selling your product. So, you know, that, that's worth something to you as you're trying to get out into the market and differentiate your product against the competition. Uh, it mitigates market risk. It also gives you a chance to price premium, right? Because you don't want to be the cheapest provider. That's just a race to the bottom. You'd rather have premium pricing, have features in your product that sell your product at a premium price. Um, you might also have licensing opportunities. So, for example, your patent might be applicable to different types of industries. And so maybe you could license off to John Deere that they could use in the agricultural industry. In the meantime, if you want to build your business in you know, the uh, aeronautical industry or wherever else this might apply, you can do that. Rent them a field of use to use in the agriculture industry. And that would create maybe some licensing opportunities. The other thing is if you're going to go ask for money from an investor, Having certainly an issued patent creates what's called pre-money valuation. What that means is, if you're looking for money, an investor to invest money in your company, you have the higher your pre-money valuation is, the less equity you have to give away in exchange for an investment. So that's a good thing, right? You get to retain more of your company. Um, we became first to invent. Uh, we used to be first. I'm sorry. We were first to invent. We became first to file and permanent with the rest of the world. So. Again, more emphasis on getting your application on file as soon as possible. Um, a little bit about infringement. You know, this is illegal, so I'm not. I can't give you specific advice. Um, I talked about the doctrine of equivalence. So there's, there's. How do you enforce? You know, if somebody were being uh, infringing on you, the concepts of direct infringement is if somebody else is making, using, or selling a process that reads on each and every element of your of your patent. Um, Additionally, through the doctrine of equivalence, if, if their device performs the same function in the same way, produces the same results, that could be a way to broad, more broadly interpret your claims in case somebody that's infringing. Um, the other, in, so then there's inducement of infringement. If it's not direct infringement, somebody who's, commit, somebody who's not committing direct infringement but they're asking another to do so would be guilty of. Um, indirect inducement of infringement. So if somebody is selling, you have a method patent on doing something and a, and a device, and somebody's selling instructions, and their instructions basically infringe your method patent, but they're not doing it, but they're giving those instructions to somebody else, you would pursue them under inducement of infringement. A lot of this has to do with then how would you write your claims? Because are you going to write your claims towards the end user? You know, the pipe fitter that's actually using this to join pipes together, you get some novel fitting with a wrench that you know, tightens it. You're not going to go around and sue every plumber. What you'd want to do is be able to get to the distributor that's distributing it. So that bears on how you write your claims. Uh, the other would be very closely to um, inducement is contributory. Um, if somebody's making a component of it, of your device, that goes into your device, obviously goes into your device, they're making and selling it, then you can go after them under contributor because they're contributing to infringement. But the key is that that 
part that they sell can also be used in other ways, then this doesn't work. So that's probably it. Yeah. The best thing is, you know, you don't want to go to court against somebody. You, once you have a patent, if you find out somebody's infringing or close to it, you kind of wonder. The best approach is to approach them and just say, hey, you know, I think I've got some technology here. It looks like maybe you might be interested in this. You know, I'd like to have a discussion with you, and maybe you could get them to take a license. Maybe they would source product from you. And the last thing you want to have to do is hire lawyers and go to court, because you have no idea. The first thing, it costs you a fortune, and you have no idea what the end result's going to be. So, but you don't have any of those options until you get a patent on file. Okay? All right, so I know that's been very, very, a lot of material in a short amount of time, but at least you have an overview, and hopefully the takeaway is this can be done by the average person, but it is going to take diligence. You're going to have to be focused in doing your searches. You're going to have to be diligent, diligent about adhering to the requirements. Because like I said before, it's like eating an elephant one bite at a time. And I've got clients that, you know, they're not, they don't have an advanced degree. In fact, they don't have any degree. The other day, the other day we had a uh, patent issue for a guy who has a gravel business. He cleans up gravel in the yards. And we've got him an issue patent. So he's already going to John Deere and having a discussion with John Deere. So, yeah, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do this, but it does take a lot of work. And um, hopefully, you've learned at least a little bit more about that process. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.